Christianity is a religion of the book, and we as Christians should be people of the book. In Romans 10 and verse 17, we read, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And while we often quote that passage to non-believers on what they must do in order to respond to God, it's true. Faith comes initially by hearing the word of God, but faith continues to come by hearing the word of God. And to the degree that we hear from God and put his word into practice, it's to that degree that our faith will increase. The Bible is a living book, it's a life-changing book, and those that read its contents and practice them are never left the same. But sometimes we struggle. Sometimes we struggle to be like the man in Psalm 1 and verse 2 whose delight was in the law of the Lord, and in that law he meditated day and night, and maybe there are varying reasons. Sometimes our attitudes and the way we approach the Bible keeps us from getting in the Bible and staying there. We may say things like this, well, I'm just really not a smart person. I didn't really grow up studious, and I'm not a real reading and thinking type of individual. And so because of that, that kind of hampers me getting into the Word of God. I've heard that. Or sometimes somebody says about their approach to Scripture, you know, I tried to read the Bible once, and it was just difficult for me, and I really couldn't understand it. I would do better if somebody, maybe somebody with preaching school experience or somebody with a degree, you just study the Bible and then explain to me what the Word of God says. Other Christians sometimes say about getting into the Bible and saying that I tried it once. I read the Bible. I really want to. But when I read the Bible, if I'm honest, I just get bored and my thoughts start wondering and I really can't stay focused. It seems I've lost the spiritual spark that's necessary to get in the Bible and stay there. I will return to the text when the feeling returns to me. And other similar thoughts keep us from getting into the Bible. For the first few centuries, people didn't have what you have right now on your lap. People didn't have it this way. Surely Paul and Peter and others, they wrote letters, and those letters were carried by faithful ambassadors to those congregations and often read before the auditorium or the individuals gathered there and expounded, and that was to the degree that many people heard and memorized and learned large portions of Scripture, but they didn't have their own copy to read and study. They had to wait until they came to the assembly, and sometimes when we fail to get in the Bible and stay there, we're moving backwards. People that would long to have had their own copy of the Word of God, and as we have it, Maybe we don't get into it as we should. And sometimes it's not our lack of ability or desire. It's just difficult. It's a daunting task, isn't it? The Bible is a relatively difficult book in some places, and it's a rather large book. And we want to approach the Bible, but sometimes it's a lot to handle. But if the Bible is the book that God wanted us to have, and it is, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, then we can and must do this. In the time I have remaining this afternoon, I want to talk about six ways that you and I can get in the Bible and stay there. This lesson is for Christians or for anybody who's seeking to read and comprehend and understand the Bible. How do I get in the Bible? How do I bring myself to the text? Maybe you started out in January and you said, this is the year. I want to be a better Bible reader, a better Bible student. How can I do it? Every year I want to do it. Every time I try to do it, I get started and I stop. Or maybe you're somebody who you're on again, off again, two months in the Bible, three months out. How can I make it my consistent practice? I hope these points will help us this afternoon as we delve into this together. Number one, we need to appreciate our need for the Bible. The first thing we have to do if we would really get in the Bible and stay there is appreciate just how much we really need the text from God. Psalm 25 and verse 4, the psalmist says, Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. We really do need to be guided and directed by God. You remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil in Matthew chapter 4? The first time the devil says, if you be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And Jesus responds by quoting Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3. And he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus was telling Satan on that occasion what we all know if we really are in tune with Scripture. And that is, we cannot live without the Bible. Before we talk about how to get in the Bible and stay there, we need to appreciate this point. You and I, we need the Bible. Jesus told Satan, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We need to first appreciate as we come to the text of Scripture that this is something that is for our benefit. It is something that you and I, we need to do. If we don't have this attitude, if we come to the text as if it's really up to us, it's our choice, we're going to miss out on the riches that we find in Scripture. And so we do need to humble ourselves down and humble our hearts to see this is ultimately for our own good. The psalmist says in Psalm 119 and verse 133, order my steps in your word. 
Do you see yourself as somebody who actually needs the Bible, somebody who's desperately searching and reaching out to God, and we need to study the text of Scripture and to glean the wisdom that God has for us in his pages until we develop that heart posture, until we're those types of people that say, I'm not wise enough to govern myself, we'll never get in the Bible and we'll never stay there when we do. First, we need to say to ourselves, we need it. The gospel according to Satan is this. You and I are so smart, so industrious, so wise, so self-sufficient that the last thing we need is a God to give us a book, to give us rules, and to snatch all of the fun out of our lives. But the opposite is true. You and I are honestly sin-sick, lost sheep, often discouraged people that need to hear from a God who loves us and wants to direct our way back to him. Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 13, Moses said, This is what God wants from you, to keep his word, walk in his statutes, which I give you and command you this day for your good. It's for our good that God's given us the Bible. And do you know why he's done that? It's because we need it. Moses was at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, and you remember he has this encounter with God, and God says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and go and tell Israel that I've come to deliver them and give them the land of the Canaanites. And Moses does that. But Jim Wilkins is right when she says, for you and for me, the Bible is our burning bush. If we are going to hear from God, it's to the degree that we come into contact with the text that God has given us, and we make it a part of who we are. It's not enough to say we need to read the Bible dutifully, which we do because the Bible commands us to study it. But we must read the Bible desperately because without it, we are lost and wandering sheep without any place to go. You and I need to first approach the Bible acknowledging our desperate need. We are spiritually impoverished. If God didn't speak to us from heaven, we wouldn't know where to go. We need the Bible. We need the Bible to tell us how to be saved, Acts chapter 2, 37 and 38. When they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter and others were able to give an answer as they were led by the Holy Spirit, and they wrote those words down so we can continue to share it with other people. We need the Bible to tell us the truth about ourselves. Romans 3 says, there's none righteous, no, not one. We need the Bible to introduce us to God. Exodus 34, 6 and 7, God describes himself as gracious, long-suffering, not letting evil get past him. We need the Bible to tell us who God is. We need the Bible to lift us up when we're discouraged. Proverbs 12, 25 talks about anxiety weighing down the heart, but a good word, that would be the words of Scripture, makes it to rise. And we need the Bible to reveal the glories of heaven to us. 2 Peter 3, 13 says, we look for a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. You see, before we talk about the Bible, we first have to appreciate, acknowledge your need for it. Now, here's number two. How to get in the Bible and stay there, avoid enemies to Bible study. Avoid the enemies that are out there that would keep us from the Word of God. I guess most people didn't know this until it was revealed in the documentary, The Last Dance, but Michael Jordan talks in that documentary about the idea that what he would use to get him geared up for competition is he would just manufacture enemies. He would imagine in his mind that his opponents or critics were saying negative things about him, and it would give him that extra edge. It would give him the extra oomph that he needed. I don't know how much extra edge Michael Jordan needed, but he used it anyway to defeat his enemies. You and I don't have to do that. We don't have to manufacture an enemy because there actually is an enemy of the soul. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 says, Be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. The Bible says we're to bring every thought into captivity and obedience to Jesus, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, and he is doing everything that he can to get us to think about everything but the Word of God. If we're going to study our Bibles, we need to be people that acknowledge there's a sense in which we're on the enemy's turf. I know God created this world. This is our Father's world, but the Bible also says the devil is the prince of this world, the God of this world. And so he's not exactly creating conditions that'll be conducive for you and I to get a good Bible study in. The devil's not interested in making sure everything aligns perfectly in your life so that you have a consistent, quiet time with God. No, that's not true at all. And the only way to be successful in war is to appreciate who is my enemy and what are his tactics. And often, sometimes, we just give in too easily to them. What are some of the enemies to avoid in Bible study? Number one, procrastination. Sometimes, we just procrastinate. Brian Tracy, in his book, Eat That Frog, 21 Ways to Avoid Procrastination, he levels, he talks about our, our duties as if they were frogs. And he said, if you ever have to eat a frog, do it first thing in the morning. 
And he says, if you have to eat two of them, eat the ugliest one first. His idea, his point is really, when you have difficult things to do, if you delay, if you think about it all day, if you plan, if you postpone, one of these days turns into none of these days, and someday is not a day of the week. Sometimes we procrastinate. We, like Felix, wait for a more convenient time, which will never come. I'm not a morning person. I can't read in the morning. You know a good recipe for never studying the Bible, never getting in the Bible and staying there? Just wait until it's really late at night. Get up in your bed nice and comfy. Bring the lights down real low, and it won't be long. You'll be in your third dream. You won't be reading much of the Bible at all. Sometimes we procrastinate. We put things off. We put them on the back burner, and we say, I really want to be a better Bible student, but we procrastinate. But that's not all. Number two, sometimes it's distraction. With every beep and ding and message and alert and notification, it's hard for us to really just sit down with the text and the text alone and focus. And though the context is different, 1 Corinthians 7, 35 has something to say to us about this point where Paul says, I would that you were able to serve the Lord without distraction. We need to sanctify our devotional time. And while there will be emergencies and there will be things that come in that we just have to pause and get to, we have to say, this is God's time and God's alone, and I won't be interrupted. I'm going to give myself over to this, and I want to do it at this time for this purpose. Nobody can read the Bible every day, all day. I don't think God wants us to do that. There's too much in the Bible for us to do than to die in our studies. However, the time that we set aside to study needs to be actually the time that we study. Sometimes it's procrastination. Sometimes it's distraction. Number three, sometimes it's this one. It's just laziness. Sometimes it's just laziness. You know, the Bible comes down hard on the slothful individual. Romans 12 and verse 11 says, Be not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. If we're honest, sometimes when it comes to our getting into the Bible and staying there, we can be very lazy. We just don't have much energy. We don't want to put much into it. Jeremiah 48 and verse 10, he says, Cursed is the one that keeps back his sword from bloodshed, who's slack in doing the Lord's work. And like the one talent man, sometimes we have enough energy to make excuses for not doing it instead of using those same energies to actually get into it and do what it is that we can do. We need to avoid those enemies. But the last enemy, and this is probably the worst of all, the enemy that keeps us from getting in the Bible and staying there most often is ourself. Nobody can stop you from reading the Bible if you really want to. I know sometimes people are worried about our culture and the things that are going on and what's going to happen to our religious freedoms potentially. But the truth is many people have already surrendered them without anybody imposing anything on them. Somebody says, they're going to take my Bible. Well, you weren't reading it anyway. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy. Sometimes the reason why we don't get into the Bible, one of the enemies is it's just ourselves. We don't want to. We don't put in the effort, and we should. Before we can get in the Bible and stay there, we need to appreciate our enemies and who they are, and we need to have the right heart posture as we approach the text so that we don't get in our own way. Here are seven heart postures to have as we approach the Word of God. Approach the Bible prayerfully. Don't just pick up the Bible and open it up and join in and just read. We should approach the Bible prayerfully. It's God's book. Let's talk to God and make sure we rightly handle the Word of truth. We're not praying for any illumination or any special revelation. The Bible's not dead. We're not praying for God to make it alive. It's already alive, but we need to pray that God helps our mind be in the right place. The psalmist in Psalm 119 and verse 18 says, God, open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things out of your law. That needs to be a part of our prayer. Number two, approach the Bible humbly. Some people, and Forrest talked about this, their problem with the Bible is they come to sit on trial. They put the Bible on trial, but the more you read the Bible, the more we see we're the ones that are on trial and not the Bible. 1 Peter 5 and verse 6, he says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. When you and I approach the text, we should do it humbly. I'm a sinner. He's a savior. He knows everything. Without him, I know nothing. God, what are you going to teach me? I've read these passages hundreds and hundreds of times, but there's still riches to be discovered here. And may my heart humbly appreciate that, and may I try to learn. May I not read the Bible and say, all of those people out there need to be fixed. Humbly approach the Bible and say, God, Destroy every piece of unrighteousness in me. But number three, we need to approach the Bible studiously. Somebody says the Bible's hard to understand sometimes. Why would we expect it to be otherwise? 
Paul told Timothy, study or give every effort to show yourself approved. Peter says as much in 2 Peter 1 and verse 10, give diligence, the same word is used. In both texts, give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. Approach the Bible with this idea, I'm coming as a student. That means you might need a dictionary. And you might need a concordance, and you might need maps, because you see, the Bible is to be read, but it's also to be studied. This is not the morning newspaper. This is not the New York Times. The Bible is a book to be read, but it's also to be studied. Number four, approach the Bible obediently. If you love me, keep my what? Keep my commandments. If we're not going to do what the Bible says, we're not really being true to it. Number five, approach the Bible joyfully. Oh, how love I your law. It's my meditation all the day. The Bible is a book, really, of good news. The last word in the Old Testament deals with curses, but the last word in the New Testament deals with the grace of God. The Bible is a book to be joyful about. There are hard things in the Bible. John was told some of the things he would digest as a prophet would make his belly bitter, but there was also sweetness there. And the sweetest part, of course, is Jesus Christ. Number six, approach the Bible expectantly. When you and I read the Bible, we should expect to be changed. When we go out and talk to other people and teach them the Bible, we should expect it to change them. In Isaiah 55, God promises, my word will not return to me void. The more we study the Bible, we should expect to see results. And then number seven, approach the Bible Christocentrically. That means look for Jesus. The Bible ultimately is about a person. Jesus told the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. And those scriptures you read, they actually testify about me. Read the Bible and find Jesus as he's talked about in the old prophesied. There are allusions and mentions of his coming. And then in the New Testament, as he explodes on the scene in the Gospel of Matthew and walks with his people throughout the epistles. And you see him at the end of the Bible in Revelation as our Savior approached the Bible Christocentrically. We've got to avoid enemies to the Bible if we would get in the Bible and stay there. Now, here's number three. Appreciate that there are different avenues to explore. This is about getting in the Bible and staying there. What do I need to do in order to get in the Bible and stay there? Appreciate your need. You need the Word of God. You need the Bible. But number two, avoid enemies, distraction. Don't use yourself as an excuse. Don't be lazy. But then number three, appreciate that there are avenues to explore. When Paul was near the end of his life in 2 Timothy 4, you remember what he told Timothy? Do your diligence to come before winter. By the way, go by Troas and get the cloak that I left and bring with you the parchments, the books. Bring the cloak that I left and get my materials, get my tools that I need. Now, I don't know what Paul planned to write, and I don't know if Timothy ever made it with those materials, but Paul wanted those things. And if you and I are going to get in the Bible and stay there, we need to explore all the avenues that are available for us to be able to do that. Jonathan Mooney couldn't read by the time he was 12 years old. He still couldn't read. His teachers, they pretty much diagnosed him with every learning disability that they could. They said he had dyslexia, ADHD. He was badly behaved. He was a misfit. Ten years later, he graduated Ivy League, Brown University, with honors. He now goes around and talks about this, and they said, well, how did you do it? They talked to him and to his mom, and what did you do to be sure that the prophecies laid on him by his teachers ultimately proved to be false? He said, I just had to get out of their system. He said, this is what I learned. In the end, if the child can't learn what you're teaching, teach in a way that the child learns. They had a system. They wanted me to learn this way. I couldn't grasp what they were teaching. And as soon as I worked out of their system, I learned the same material, but I learned it my way. Sometimes when we talk about getting in the Bible and staying there, let us not waste too much time about the different methods and ways. And let's just get in there and do it. There are various ways to get into the Bible. One of the ways that may be underemphasized, that we might overlook, Oh, this is how many people learned the Bible in the first century. Colossians 4.16, Paul tells the church, when you get the letter from me, make sure that it's read. And then you go to Laodicea and swap letters with them. 1 Thessalonians 5.27, Paul says, read this letter to all the holy brethren. One avenue to explore to get into the word of God is in the worship assembly. We need to come together one with another and study the word of God together. What about this? What about a Bible reading plan? Sometimes I say, well, I just, in the mornings, just open my Bible and go. And I guess that's good, right? You can just, as long as you get in the Bible, that's good. But just flip and open at random. What if you had a plan of some sort? What if there was a systematic way to get into the Bible with, at small chunks at a time and learn the Word of God? You could read through the whole Bible, four chapters a day. 
You can read through the whole New Testament in a month, nine chapters a day, maybe 40, 45 minutes a day. You could do that. You can read through the New Testament this year, just one chapter every day. What if you developed a system, a plan where you said, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to get into the Bible. I'm going to explore the avenues available to me, and I'm going to avail and apply myself. What about this one? Avenues to explore. We now live in a day and age. Somebody says, I don't like reading. Well, guess what? You've got a smartphone, right? The phone may be smarter than us most times, but guess what? You can download apps like YouVersion and Olive Tree, and they'll read the Bible to you. What if you and I said, you know what I'm going to do to get in the Bible this year? On my way to work, I'm going to listen to a chapter, and then on the way home, I'll listen to the radio or whatever I want to do. What if you said, during my lunch break, I'll listen to a chapter or two, or maybe when I exercise, I'm going to get into the Word of God. Whatever we had to do to get into the Word of God, there are all kinds of avenues to explore. God has richly provided for us through providence in our generation and in our time to get in the Bible and stay there. But this is the problem. Sometimes there are so many tools on the table that we exercise none of them. All of them are great, and we can talk about tools and calendars and methods all day long, but until we avail ourselves to them and commit to getting into the Word of God, it'll do us no good. You can put questions in the box about different methods, and we can talk about some of those, but there are varying avenues to explore. But you know what's the best method? It's the one that you'll use in practice. Now, here's the next one, number four, I believe. We need a resolve to stick with it. If we're going to get in the Bible and stay there, once we realize we need it, once we avoid the enemies, once we find the way that we choose to get into it, whether that be audio, whether that be through a different plan, we need a resolve to stick with the Bible. Netflix has this down to a science, don't they? Netflix binges, getting people addicted to shows, and it's not by accident. They actually watch how much you watch, and they actually have shows and stats that show at what episode a person's hooked, never to turn away from this episode again. They have it down to a science, and this is what they've concluded. People just make up their minds at a certain point. This is my show, and I'll watch it no matter what. No matter what it takes, no matter how I have to adjust my schedule, what if we did that with the Word of God? What if we just said, this is my year, 2021, no more secondhand knowledge, no more depending on somebody else to do it for me. I'm going to be like the psalmist and get into the word of God. Psalm 119 and verse 15 says, I've rejoiced in the way of your testimonies. I delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your law. The psalmist just says, I'm just going to do it. Sometimes we don't get in the Bible and stay there because we just don't think we can. But I want to encourage you this afternoon. Yes, you can. Job said, your words were meant more to me than my necessary food. Job 23 and verse 12. Yes, we can. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4 and verse 13. Listen to Ezra. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments, Ezra 7 and verse 10. And guess what Ezra did? He did. We can get in the Bible and we can stay there if we believe that we can. Henry Ford said, if you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. Either way, you're right. You may never become a Bible scholar or a preacher or even a Bible class teacher, but you can learn more of the Bible this year than you knew last year if you just have a resolve to stick with it. Make up your mind. Let's make up our minds that, guess what? I'm going to get in the Bible for myself, and I'm just going to stick with it. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to go to the well every day over and over again and delve into Scripture over and over again. It's what Paul told Timothy. Study or give every effort to present yourself approved. We can do that if we want. If we put our minds to it, we can read the Bible with profit. Number five, we need an appreciation for the Bible. If you and I are going to get in the Bible and stay there, it's to the degree that we actually appreciate it. There's never been a time in our lives when we didn't have it, and so maybe we don't think about it as much as we should, but we need to develop an appreciation for the Word of God. God didn't have to give it to us, but he chose to in his love. And when people write about Scripture in Scripture, it's impressive to listen to the delicate language that they use to talk about how much the Bible means to them. The psalmist says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. Enduring forever, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, more to be desired than they are gold. Yes, they're much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. The psalmist David is saying in Psalm 19, God gave natural revelation, and that is amazing. And you can look at the stars that he hung, Genesis chapter 1, and the sun, and you can be impressed with, I'm not here by accident. But that's not enough. 
God went further than that because we need it more than natural revelation. God gives special revelation so that we can not only know that he exists, but we can know why we exist and how to make our way back to him. That's something natural revelation could never do. And so God went a step further and gave us the Bible. Now, here's the question. Do you appreciate it? Do I appreciate it? Do our study habits reflect our answers to those, those questions? We can say all day, I appreciate the Bible. I really love the Bible, but how do we use it? Some of us got things for Christmas, and we smiled when we opened it, and we told people we were thankful, and it's already in the garage somewhere, right? We really didn't appreciate it. Somebody gives you something, and then they find themselves on Amazon later, and you're selling the very thing you told them you really appreciated and you love to have. You're just giving it away. That would be testimony to the fact that it really doesn't mean that much to you. How much does the Bible mean to you? How much does it mean to me? If we're going to get in the Bible and remain with it, if we're going to stay in it, it's to the degree that we appreciate it. And we show God how thankful we are, how much we appreciate him by our commitment and diligence to reading the Bible and to putting it into practice. You know, James says in James 1, 22 and 23, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word, lest we deceive our own selves. The God of the Bible, if you really study scripture and see, he's not really that impressed with how much Bible people know. He's more impressed with how much Bible they practice. The truth is, if we know God's word, we should practice it. But just because we have a ready recall of the Bible doesn't mean much to God until we start doing what he says. Getting in the Bible and staying there involves this idea. I appreciate what you've given me, God. I want to learn it and rehearse it in my mind and then allow it to form and shape my character. Until we cover all of those bases, we don't appreciate the Bible as much as we say, no matter how loud we sing, how many passages we highlight and underline, am I reading it? Am I internalizing it, and am I allowing it to form and shape my character? Give the Bible a chance. Just do what it says, and watch it how it will transform you and those you come into contact with. Now, here's the last one, how to get in the Bible and stay there. Just accept ownership of your own spiritual development. I guess every family has this at Thanksgiving. Maybe your family had this. Did y'all have the kitty table? You had the adult sitting here, and then you just have the kitty table. And when you're at the kitty table, you just can't wait to one day be at the grown-up table, right? At the kitty table, you have to sit there and wait. They're fixing plates. They'll bring you your plate, right? You and the cousins, everybody's there. But then one day, you're 13, you're 14, and guess what? You're at the big boy table now, right? You get to sit up with everybody else and watch the Detroit Lions lose again. Everybody, right? But here's the point. Spiritually speaking, there comes a point when you and I have got to get up from the kitty table. We do. We've got to take off the bib. We've got to stop waiting for somebody to come down and rescue us from biblical ignorance. I mean, God wants to help us, and this can be difficult. But there comes a point where we have to own up and say, I'm going to, take, I'm going to get me a reliable and readable translation that I can understand. I'm going to get me a plan. No more excuses. I'm going to do it. It was good for me to draw near to God, Asaph says, Psalm 73, 28. It's not just true for Asaph. It's true for you, and it's true for me. I'm just going to do it. Not going to wait on anybody. No more excuses. 2021, no more excuses. I'm going to get in the Bible. If I don't finish in a year, you know it's better to finish the Bible in 18 months than never at all. Sometimes people stop. Well, I didn't get through in a year. I'll just start over. But this is the year I'm just going to accept ownership of my own spiritual development. James 4 and verse 8, James says, draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. You're as close to God as you choose to be. And if that gap will continue to close, and if we'll get closer, God has left that in our ball court. Every time you pull on the string, in a sense, for lack of better words, God moves an inch closer to you, not because we control him, but the word of God is the means through which God has said he would draw near to us, and as much of that as we want, God is willing to give it to us. Before David died, he told Solomon a lot of things about being faithful, but in 1 Chronicles 28 and verse 9, he said, if you forsake God, he'll forsake you, but if you cling to God, he'll cling to you. If you get into the word of God, the word of God will get into you, and it'll make all the difference. I've got some friends that sometimes practice martial arts, and I've talked to some of them before about how this practice works, and they all say pretty much the same things. This is not about becoming the next karate kid. It's not about becoming so lethal that you learn how to hurt other people. This discipline is ultimately about self-control, maybe self-defense, and it'll help you in many avenues of life. They always say, remember why you got into this discipline. It's not for any other means except to help you. And the same thing's true about the Bible. How to get in the Bible and stay there, we better remember why we got into this. This isn't about I'm smarter than you, I'm better than you. Why do we come to the Bible in the first place? And it's to learn more about Jesus so that we can find our way back to him.
In Luke 24, 44, Jesus said, everything written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms was really about me. If you and I really want to get in the Bible, fall in love with Jesus. And if you really want to fall in love with Jesus, you'll do it as you get into the Bible. The Bible's a great book. The sad thing is, is treasures are often untapped as we don't read it as much as we should, or maybe as much as we could. And maybe some of these things has helped us to jump the hurdle, has helped me, because every one of us could stand to hear from God a little bit more. Let us do all that we can to get in the Bible, but most importantly, let the Bible get into us. All right, appreciate that great lesson and appreciate the points he had and the encouragement that he gives us to stay in the Bible. And so we appreciate that. We're going to stand and sing a song. Uh, Brother Tim Simmons is going to lead us in that song. And then I will briefly introduce the speaker just for the sake of the video. Uh, but Joshua Cantrell will bring us a lesson right after that. Please turn to 679, 679, they'll know we are Christians, 679. Our next speaker, Brother John. We live in a world today that is greatly influenced by the culture in which we find ourselves in. As soon as you turn on the television, there is culture. When you drive down the street, there is culture. Culture is even found in the way we talk. A culture is found in where we go to school. Culture is found in the way we grow up. Culture is all around us. But the question for consideration this afternoon is, does culture affect doctrine? Should culture affect doctrine? First of all, this afternoon, I believe we have to come, or we have to get out of this idea of uh, the church somehow wanting to uh, be like the world. I tell people all the time, you know, there's this strange idea of the world uh, coming into the church. When the church, we need to get out into the world. The Bible talks about in Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul there talks about be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A couple years ago, there was this trend that just took the world by storm, and the phrase more or less was YOLO. You only live once. We hear all the different trends. We hear all the different cliches. The other day, ironically, an individual, I asked them how they were doing, and they said to me, well, you know what, Josh? I'm too anointed to be disappointed. I'm too stressed to, and, 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 and all these other things that we find going on within the world today. 
First of all, this afternoon, there has to be a standard. There has to be a total absolute of something that is good and that is true. Well, what is that standard? The Bible lets us know in, in John 14 and verse 6, Christ speaks of himself saying, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the light. John 8 verse 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The Bible constantly lets us know that there is a standard. There is something that is absolute good. There is something that is absolute right and perfect all the time and that's God. I don't know about you this afternoon, but there have been many of times where I thought to, to myself that, you know what, Josh, you're really right about this thing, only to come to realize I have no idea what it is I'm talking about. Only come to realize, you know what, someone actually knows more than I do about a certain issue or a certain topic, but the one who knows more than us all the time is the God in heaven. And if the God in heaven knows more than us all the time, that lets me know immediately that the standard he has given us, the standard he has put in place, the standard called the Bible is absolute good. And it's not just good some of the time, it's good all the time. When you look at the Bible, when you look at everything it has to say about our salvation, you look at everything it has to say about culture, John chapter 4, or we'll talk about that at the end as we make some application. But again, the Bible lets us know there is a standard. There is something that is absolute. If you remember in Hebrews 10, verse 7, there the Bible says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. Ephesians 3, verse 4, Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of a Christ. Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. John 5 39, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they that testify in me. In terms of this culture and this doctrine, before we even talk about the two, there has to be a standard. What is that standard? It's the word of God. What is the thing that is absolutely right and true all the time? It's the word of God. Secondly, this afternoon, not only is there a standard, but we also want to talk about this idea of culture. What is culture? There are many of times where I find myself talking to young adults or talking to uh, individuals who are younger than me, and I find myself uh, realizing as soon as we get used to one terminology about a certain subject, it, 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 it's almost as if the next day that word means something different than it meant five or six years ago. And we see how culture is always changing. Culture is always moving on to the next thing that is trendy and that is good. But if it's one thing that is constant, that is consistent, that will remain the same, is God's word. Culture, again, is found in everything. In different countries, people do things differently than we do in America. Now, in any way, is that wrong? Absolutely not. It is a part of their culture. It is a part of how they do things. It is a part of how they grew up as well. So again, the question is, Josh, how does culture affect the Bible? Do those things enter scope? Do those things have anything to do with each other? Again, there is a standard. There is something that is set in place in order for us to see that God wants us to be right. First of all, when we're talking about culture, we have to realize that culture changes. Again, as we just stated to you, over a period of years, over a period of days, over a period of hours, something can mean one thing, and in a certain few hours later, it means something different. Again, as I mentioned to you, uh, there was one time a couple years ago, I went into the back at our uh, congregation. I was working with the young adults or the, or, or the youth group there. And they were, you know what, just hanging out, having a good old time, uh, using words that I knew nothing of, and I, and I think that's a bad thing uh, because I'm not any much uh, older than they are. But they were just hanging about, having a good old time, and they came to ask me uh, what a certain dance was. And I, you know, proceeded to tell them what the dance was, and they say in response to that, well, uh, Josh, you must be really old. Because that dance was X amount of years ago, only to come to realize the dance was only maybe two or three years ago. And it just goes to show you again how culture just simply changes over a period of time. Not only is culture, not only does it change, but culture is also something that is learned. 
You can have three individuals stand up here with one song, and they each sing the song differently. Why is that? Because they each have learned the song a certain way. Now, does that in any implication say one is singing it right and one is singing it wrong? I guess if you look at the music and the notes, maybe. But for the most part, that it just goes into that person and their culture and how they grew up. But not only does culture change, not only does culture is learned by individuals, but culture, unfortunately, also has made its way into the church. Now, again, a couple years ago, there was a big time slogan that had came about and the slogan was totally inappropriate. And so what a congregation did was they took that slogan and they tried to appeal it to the young people. They tried to appeal it to this youth thing that they were going to do. I'll say it now and I always say it again. The children need to be entertained, absolutely, but they also need to be taught. They also have to know what the Bible has to say about a certain issue because I come to realize that a lot of young people really want to know what the Bible has to say. They really want to know what they have to do to be right with God. They really want to know that if I do this, if this is any way a violation to God's law, they really want to know the answer to those questions, and we have all the answers. We know how to help them, but yet very often we refuse to help them. But not only can we talk about culture, but we also have to talk about doctrine as well. What is doctrine? Again, many individuals have defined doctrine as uh, many different things in preparation for the material this afternoon. But a good definition of doctrine I like to use is uh, the act of teaching or that which is taught or the belief of Christians. Now, again, when you look at the New Testament, Acts 2, verse number 42, down to verse 47, the Bible lets us know how they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and in prayers. Titus 2, verse 1, there he says, Speak thou the things that become sound doctrine. Then he starts listing behavioral issues with the implication there being clear. The way I act is also associated with the doctrine of Christ. Well, how do you know that, Josh? Because I know for a fact Jesus taught on the importance of loving each other. Jesus taught on the importance of forgiveness. Jesus taught on the importance of reconciliation. All those issues go into the doctrine of Christ. Now, again, I'm looking at it from the perspective, culture, okay? I see that culture continues to change. And then I look at it from a totally different side of things, and I see how doctrine is the same. Doctrine is consistent. Doctrine is not going to go to the right hand nor to the left. But culture does. But what's the point of that? Many want to, many want to bring culture and try to mix it with Scripture. And we come to realize the more culture we bring in, the more Bible we put out. And, and, and when we get to the point where we are emphasizing culture over what the Bible has to say, that's going to be a very bad day for the Lord's body. But when you find over the past 12 months, over the past 20 years, over the past 100 years, many love this idea of bringing culture, of bringing the world into the church, and we wonder why we're not carrying out the Great Commission. I can tell you exactly why. Because our minds are on something else. Our minds are caught up in those worldly things that are not making us better Christians, that is not spreading the gospel to those that are lost, and we see people just slowly going out the back door, and we have the thing that can help them. But you know what? We like to make people feel good, don't we? We like for people to feel good about their sinful condition. They can go out lost just as, the, just as lost as they came in, and they believe in their minds that they're okay when they're not. But yet culture tells us, you know what? You don't have to change. You're fine just the way you are. Culture tells us you don't have to be baptized. You don't have to change the way you talk. You don't have to change the way you live. You don't have to change the things you say. Culture says, you know what? If it feels good, just go ahead and do it. Culture says, you know what? It's really not that big of a deal. Culture says you really don't have to listen to your parents. Culture said, you know what? Matter of fact, you tell your parents you run the house. I don't know about you, but that never would have worked in the Cantrell household. Going to tell my parents, you know what? I don't want to do that today. I don't want to go down to the youth rally. 
I don't want to go down here to worship a Bible class. Growing up, uh, me, I guess, so to say, grew up in the church. We were always at church. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, doing all over it again. And I come to realize that now that I'm older, I appreciate those, those things. Because there are those right here, right now, who wish that their parents would almost make them go to those things, but they're so caught up in what culture has to say that they now have no idea what the Bible has to say. I can remember in seventh grade when I first made the basketball team, I can remember the first Wednesday of seventh grade. Here we are at basketball practice having a good time. Here we are at basketball practice just enjoying ourselves. And I see my dad walk in in the back and he says, you know what, we have to go. And I'm upset asking him, why do we have to go? He said, we have to go to Bible study. And after that, I never questioned that again. But culture tells us you don't have to go to Bible study. Culture tells us you don't have to listen. Again, there is a standard. There is something that is absolute all the time. Again, doctrine is vital for our salvation. Again, from the gospels, God's love for mankind, uh, all those things associated help us appreciate what God has and what God continues to do for, for us. Culture is conditional. Culture, like anything, is going to change. Again, we can turn on our news right now, CNN, and see one thing. A year from now, it's going to be something totally different. And next thing you know, that is what the world is going to see. That is what the world is going to want to be a part of. But as Christians, oh, our aim has to be something different. Our mindset has to be on something different. It has to be on the gospel. It has to be on saving souls. And if we're so caught up in culture, if we're so caught up in what's going on in the world, we're going to lose the thing that makes us different. If you remember in Revelation chapter 2, what was John's charge to that church? Oh, they did a number of things right, but ultimately he says, you left your first love. You lost your identity. You left the thing that has made you different. But I also come to realize that if we take a careful examination of ourselves, if we do, as I like to say, a spiritual autopsy on our own lives, we come to realize there are some things about ourselves that we need to get out. The more we get the world out of our mind, we make room for God. We make room for the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, what does Paul say there? Examine yourself. James 1, verse 25, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that word look at their Greek word perikupto, taking us over to John 23 and 4. When Peter outran John to the sepulcher, the Bible says in him stooping down and looking in, same word in James 1, verse 25, but whoso will stoop down, look into the word of God, James says that man will be blessed in his deeds. Culture, oh, it's everywhere. Doctrine, it's not everywhere. I don't know about you, but that seems like an issue to me. How can we change or what can we do to better help ourselves or better to equip ourselves to get over this? In John chapter 4, here we read about Jesus in the account with the woman at the well. Now, again, when we're talking about culture and doctrine in John chapter 4, it's almost as if uh, this entire chapter also associated as chapter 10 with that for your notes. These two chapters really go in and talk about this idea of culture and also that of doctrine. Now, again, culture changes. It's conditional. Doctrine is the same. Doctrine is true because the one who has presented it, he himself is true. The apostles were devoted to this doctrine. The apostles was willing to give their lives for this doctrine. If you remember in Acts chapter 4 and 5, when the Sanhedrin council tell these men, I don't want you to speak nor teach in the name of Jesus. We'll put you in a prison if you do. What did Peter say in Acts chapter 4 first? He said, I can't help but speak the things which I have seen and heard. Acts 529, he says, we ought to obey God rather than man. But culture tells us, you don't have to obey God. Culture tells us, you know what? Whatever man says, whatever man presents, you just do that, and you have a good time while doing that. And that's chapter 21 there when those, uh, when Paul wanted to go down to Troas, and you remember his disciples there told him, Paul, don't go down there. They'll kill you. Paul said, I'm not just ready to go down there, but I'm ready to go down there and die for the cause of Christ. There have been many of times where I have been in discussions with young adults and they will literally 
literally argue you down saying culture should be above the Bible, should be above doctrine. There have been plenty of times, again, I have discussions with a lot of young adults, and one individual said, well, you know what, Josh? I'm a black person first. And your next thing you know is doctrine becomes a subtitle to my blackness. You know what? No one has to remind me I'm black. I've been black for 26 years. But you know what? Doctrine goes before my culture. Doctrine goes before my blackness. Doctrine goes before my wants and my desires. Why is that? Because it's not about me. It's about God. It's about the gospel. It's about saving souls. It's about showing people there is a better way. You don't have to act like that. You don't have to do that. God has provided us a means whereby we can live and govern our lives, and that's the gospel. Galatians chapter 1, 11 through 16, for your notes again, Paul there also attests to that as well. In John chapter 4, of course we know here in verse number 1 and 2, Jesus here, he goes down, verse 3, he left Judea and departed again unto Galilee. The Bible says here in verse number 7, Then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me drink. Look at verse 9. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou, being a Jew, ask of drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. One of the great things I appreciate about my Lord is the fact that he was a risk taker. Now, culture during this time, no way would Jesus or should Jesus have been talking to this woman. Because culture says him, not only being a Jew, not only being a rabbi, he has no right, no reason to be talking to this woman. What's going on with this woman? First of all, she was a woman. Again, Jews or rabbis did not speak to women in this way whatsoever. Second of all, she was a Samaritan. I love this kind of topic because it helps me really study uh, 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 about the fact, of course we all know, but about the fact, oh, why did the Jews and the Samaritans just hate each other? It takes us all the way back to 722 B.C. when they brought them over into Assyrian captivity. The intermarriages had began taking place. Next thing you know, the Jews wanted nothing to do with the Samaritans. The Bible also lets us know in Ezra chapter 4 and also Nehemiah chapter 7, when the, when, when, when the Samaritans wanted to help the Jews rebuild the temple, the Jews said, no, sir, no, ma'am. The Jews said, we are all good by ourselves. It just goes to show us that sometimes we allow culture to take us so far that we begin making doctrines or we begin making points that the Bible never intended for us to make. The next thing you know, we have differences going on that have nothing to do with Bible, that have nothing to do with Scripture. It's all about what you know what, I don't want nothing to do with that person. You know what, church? If we want to go to heaven, we, 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 we should have something to do with that person. The Bible here in John chapter 4 also lets us know, again, she was a woman. Again, rabbis did not do this. But again, this is what I appreciate about Jesus. He was a risk taker. If you remember in Luke chapter 7, when Jesus goes into the house of this Pharisee, the Bible lets us know as these men are around this table, there now comes a woman in. She more or less walks over all these men, and she goes to Jesus. And if you remember there, the Bible says the Pharisee spake within himself, saying, and I just appreciate this, the fact that uh, he speaks within himself, and Jesus answers him out loud. Well, Simon, I'm going to give you this parable. And then he comes to realize he is just as sinful, if not more sinful, as the woman that they called out. The Bible says he's speaking to himself, saying, if he were a prophet, implication being clear, he's not a prophet. But if he were a prophet, he would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. But truth be told, all of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we know about some sinning. Because before we became a saint, we were a sinner. And I think very often sometimes we have on our head of self-righteousness that say, well, you know what, I don't have no idea what the preacher talking about because I've been pretty good all my life, only to come to realize if we look into the Bible, if we look into the Word of God, we have a need for Jesus just like someone else does. 
the Jews in the book of Romans with the Gentiles can appreciate that fact. Also in John chapter 8, what do we find? Jesus talking to the woman that was caught in adultery there. Jesus says, when are thine accusers? They left out one by one. In John chapter 4, again, the Bible also lets us know here in verse number 17, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, thou hast well said, for thou hast had five husbands in verse 18. Now, Jesus knows what was going on in her house. Jesus knows what's going on in your house. Jesus tells this woman, you've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. But you know what culture says? You know what culture says. You don't have to have a husband. You can just live together. You can just do what you want to do. There was probably two years ago, a, couple, a young couple came uh, to me and Brother Glasgow at church about, about, about three years ago now, and they pretty much told us, well, uh, we want to go through marriage counseling. Brother Glasgow looked at him. He said, okay. He said, well, where are you guys living? And they said, together. And he said, well, how about you just go to the courthouse and get married? Then we'll go do marriage counseling. I've come to realize that culture tells us Culture just simply takes doctrine and it just flushes it down the toilet. That's what the world's view of doctrine is. Well, how do you know that? How do we know that? Because we see it everywhere. We see it all around us. Again, in John chapter 4, culture demands or says Jesus had no reason or he should have not been talking to this woman. But yet Jesus was a risk taker. Jesus said, I know what culture says. I know what society says. I know what everyone is teaching. But Jesus says, at this point in time, culture don't matter. What matters? Her soul. Jesus knew everything there was to know about this woman. But what happens when Jesus overcame these cultural barriers? What happens when Jesus decided to be a risk taker? The Bible here lets us know once Jesus decided to be a risk taker, look at what she did in verse number 24. Verse 25, the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah is coming. So the Bible says here she went there, verse 28, to draw water. She went there at the hottest point of the day. She sees this man, verse 29, come see a man which tell me all the things ever I did. Is not this the Christ? What's the implication? Because Jesus overcame cultural barriers, because Jesus decided that this woman's soul was worth saving, she not only was saved, but her entire village as well. How important is culture? Is it important? It is. Culture is important. I'm not in any way this afternoon saying culture is not important. Culture is important, but culture also has its place. Is doctrine important? Doctrine is the most important thing. Doctrine is the thing that will take us from earth to heaven. Doctrine is the thing that is going to change the world. Well, how do you know that? Because it did many years ago. Is culture important? I keep saying yes because it is important, but you know what? Culture is not going to bring the world out of darkness into the light. Culture is not going to save us from our sins. Culture is not going to make us better, but the doctrine of Christ will. Does culture affect doctrine? Unfortunately, it does. But should culture affect doctrine? It should not. Why is that? Because God has given us a book God has given us a standard. God has given us this Bible to make us better people. I don't know about you, but I'm going to try my hardest to not allow culture to affect the way I view doctrine. Thank you so much. Excellent close to this uh, three-lesson afternoon forum. We appreciate Brother Cantrell and his uh, scripture and his delivering of it and his lesson on culture. As we have been mentioning, uh, we will take a break in just a moment, and then we will have a question and answer period while the ladies' class is going on. And if you're a lady and you'd like to be both places at once, go to the ladies' class, and this will be recorded, 
And I'm pretty sure that will. I'm not sure if it will or not. I'm pretty sure it will, though. But you know me and my impromptu suggestions here. But anyway, we appreciate uh, those lessons. And uh, perhaps it uh, jarred a question in your mind about culture and doctrine. And so please write that down and give it to us. We can put it in the box over there. And we'll address those. And what, what we'll do is when we come back from the break, uh, Forrest, Hiram, and Joshua will form kind of a panel. I'll kind of be the moderator. And of course, if uh, someone else, uh, George Beals, will get him on some of the questions, deal with some of the stuff he spoke about this morning. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Rick and Doug uh, have been delivered safely to the airport. And so they're on their way back home. Uh, they will not be able to be here for the question and answer period. But we'll have plenty of ways to address it. And we look forward to that. I uh, also mention about the book, and um, the book is available. Uh, this is our, I think, what was it, 26th, 27th, something like that. Since 1994, we've been doing a hardcover book. Some of those volumes are sold out, and so we have this. And uh, we've been selling it for $16 since about 2001 or two ish And uh, we've never raised the price on that, which, of course, means that our, our cut of that goes down, down, down. And so we'll probably change the price on it beginning next year. But for sure, uh, we will, at the lectureship, still sell them for $16 in person. But they are $16. Uh, we did find out a couple years ago, at the final sale, we have to charge tax. So we have to add tax to that. And then if you want to ship it, we'll ship it. And, but you've got to pay the postage. We don't charge handling, though, OK? Just the postage you'll, you'll get. And we'll send that to you. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, there was a uh, mess up, if you will, an error uh, in printing. And so we have uh, pages uh, 129 through 192 are somebody else's lectureship, OK? So we got a half a lesson by uh, Bruce Hatcher on Mormonism and the first half of a lesson by, um, uh, I guess I have to look. Anyway, Owens, Brother Eric Owens on why Churches don't practice church discipline. So that's good stuff. It's good material, good bonus material. Not part of our lectureship, but part of someone else's. But we do have a supplemental book. So if you buy the book, you do get this along with it. And this has the lost chapters of the lectureship book. And they are, well, part of Kyle Butts. We have all of Kyle Butts' lecture in here. If you have a book, it's chapter 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, but we have these in a booklet here. Now, if you do get the PDF, the PDF is fine, no problems. It's all the way it ought to be. But uh, had a little glitch. We'll blame it on COVID uh, situation with the book. But we appreciate your attention. We'll have a brief prayer. And uh, the latest class will be in the fellowship room. Yeah, so we'll uh, make sure we vacate the fellowship room about 325 so they can get all set up for the latest class. And then we'll have, um, we'll have the question and answers. All right, let's pray. Loving God and gracious Father, we're so thankful for this, again, this day and this time, this lectureship. We're thankful, Father, for the speakers, especially in this afternoon session as we focused on matters that are especially relevant to youth, but really relevant to all of us. And we thank you for Hiram and for Forrest and for Joshua. And we thank you for their presentations and their ability to communicate your word and to defend the faith. We pray that you will be with us now as we take a break, enjoy the fellowship. We also pray that you continue to keep us safe, uh, both physically and spiritually and continue to be with the, those who are traveling to and from during this week. We love you, and we thank you so much for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to come together at this point. We're thankful for this lectureship and the success that has been evident as we've developed things during the day. We're mindful of the teaching in your word pertaining to the inspiration and the revelation that we have in the Bible. We're thankful that we can concentrate upon that subject matter as we have uh, begun today and as it continues, God willing, into the remainder of the um, sessions. We pray that you be with each of us as we think about the seeds that have been planted all in harmony with your will. Help us to have the determination to put it into practice in our lives. We pray that you be with us as we engage in this hour. Uh, be with our sister who is teaching and uh, Brittany who's teaching the ladies, be with the ladies as they, they uh, focus upon things of a spiritual nature and be with us as we go through this Q&A session. Help us to have a love for one another, a love for the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to introduce uh, this session of the lectureship. And uh, we started doing this, I guess, about 10, 12 years ago now, but... Uh, having these afternoon forums where we focus on a particular topic of the overall theme. This year, the theme is God Breathed Scripture. And on Mondays, we have chosen for about the last four or five years to focus on youth-related matters primarily. And, of course, all of this applies to everyone anyway, but especially uh, focus on some things that the young people are struggling with in our culture today. And so the three lessons were really toward that topic this, this, this afternoon. And at the end of that, we have been, you know, like a question and answer period. And we'll do this all week, actually, but this, for today's topics, uh, we, we like most of the questions to be on the forum, but really any of the lessons of the day are fair game. And so we do have some questions in just a moment. Uh, well, one question, particularly about what, what just went on in the three sermons uh, today, this afternoon, and then about three questions dealing with some of the topics from this morning, which really also over, overflow especially into um, Hiram and Forrest's uh, lessons. And so I'll have those questions in just a moment. But uh, we're here just basically it's kind of like a Bible study. And the idea with this is that here are these speakers that have prepared, especially for these lessons. And so a lot of the material is fresh, material is fresh on their minds. And we know that they prepared for a lot more than they had time to deliver. And even their chapters in the book, uh, much of them, you know, didn't get to everything in the book. And even the stuff in the book is sometimes just the tip of the iceberg of what could be said. And so we thought it'd be good to have these guys particularly answer the questions, especially as they relate to their lessons, because they spend a lot of time studying, a lot of time writing, and so it's fresh on their mind. Having said that, though, we're here to say that, as I said earlier, it's kind of like a Bible study, that we're not here to formulate Church of Christ, quote unquote, Church of Christ doctrine, or say this is what you have to believe. 
Uh, in fact, Hiram's lesson and even both the lessons this morning were what we're concerned about is what does the Bible say? And, uh, but these teachers can help us shed light on that. And so the ultimate authority is the Bible. We're not here to make Church of Christ doctrine or say you have to believe like we believe or like they believe or whoever believes. But as long as our beliefs are in line with the Bible, that's what we, wanna, we want to be involved with. And so that's kind of the spirit of this session. And so we do have uh, George Beals here, and he, did one of the, he was one of the speakers this morning. So we'll give him the opportunity to help answer some of these as well as he sees fit. And uh, so I'll basically read the question. I may make a few statements about it, but we'll let the guys answer, and then I may have some stuff to say at the end of it. But the first question, this deals with, I guess, more with uh, Joshua's lesson. Uh, but please explain how some cultural things, like eating meat, can be sin or it can be authorized by God. And there the reference, I guess, goes back to 1 Corinthians 10, maybe Romans chapter 14. But So if you want to turn your Bibles there, I'm sure there'll be some sum to that. But if Joshua wants to address that, I'll leave that right here for him to address. And then if anybody else wants to say something about it, and they, they don't have to really necessarily go in that order, but whoever. So again, the question is, please explain how some cultural things like eating meats uh, can be sinned or can be authorized by God. Of course, uh, the verse in reference is 1 Corinthians chapter 9. There Paul addresses the topic uh, with meat offered to idols. And I think I'm going to look at that one. So I'm going to kind of look at it from a different, uh, a different point of view. I don't, I don't know if he's going to use that one, but I'm just kind of, just kind of saying. One of the things that comes to my mind as far as cultural differences, when you think about a verse that comes to my mind, Romans chapter 16, 16, uh, there Paul says, salute one another uh, with a holy kiss, the churches of Christ salute you. Of course, in the age in which we live today, that is something uh, that we do not practice. Uh, we, we, we don't greet each other with, uh, with any type of kiss. We do handshakes. Uh, is one right or is one wrong? Absolutely not. Again, it just comes down to cultural difference. Again, uh, I mentioned in the sermon earlier, uh, there are songs that we sing differently. Uh, earlier, we sung the song Angry Words, uh, and at home, we sing it much differently. A song also that comes to my mind is uh, What Can Wash Away My Sins. At some point in times in the sermon or in the, in the worship, uh, towards the beginning, we'll sing it quicker, uh, but when it's time to do the invitation song, the song leader sings it differently. And again, those just are cultural matters and it's not to say one person is right and one person is wrong. Again, it just comes down to differences. And so again, there are so many different uh, other uh, accounts, other illustrations that we use to just show the differences. And again, but, uh, and again those are not sinful within themselves. But again, once we try to uh, make it dogmatic, or once we say someone should do this or someone shouldn't do this, uh, then we need to have some Bible to be able to back that up as well. So thank you. For what it's worth, I was not going to answer this question. Brian said, turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 8, and that's what I did. And then the next thing you know, I ended up here. Anyway, um, but concerning the cultural questions about things like meat being sin or not sin, I think 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10 is really the way to go. Romans 14 and 15, there's a parallel, but I think there's a different discussion, though the principles are much the same. Romans 14 and 15 seems as if Paul is describing there to eat meat or not to eat meat, maybe vegetarian versus some Judaizing laws, but in 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10, the discussion is about meat that's been sacrificed to idols. And Paul makes it plain, and I think this helps with this question about when is something approved and then when is something not. And as Paul basically speaking out of both sides of his mouth, how do we make the distinction? Well, let's read the first seven verses of 1 Corinthians 8, and then I guess we can make some application as well. But Paul says, now as touching things offered to idols, we know we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. If any man thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man loves God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things which are offered in sacrifice to idols, 
we know, and by the way, throughout this whole section, the main word is know. Paul's talking about their knowledge. We know that an idol is nothing in the world, and there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God and Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and of one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. How be it, there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing, as if it were offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Paul is worried about several things as it relates to the meat that's been offered to idols. He states the plain truth in these verses. We know an idol is nothing but a figment of individual's imagination. We have that knowledge. Then he quotes Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, there's one Lord, there's only one God. However, some people, when they eat this meat that had been sacrificed to idols, they do it in worship. And throughout chapters 8, 9, and 10, Paul's point is simply, you can eat the meat, it's just food. But if there's ever the occasion where you're eating this meat and somebody would even get the impression that you're doing this in uh, participation with or support of the idolatry, then Paul is saying that you should refrain. Furthermore, the second thing he says is, if it's going to cause your brother to stumble. That's at the end of this, 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 13. He says, if meat makes my brother to offend, I won't eat meat again as long as the world stands. And so something in our culture can be just relatively good. Nothing wrong with eating meat. But if it's perceived as that which joins us to worldliness or sin, then we should refrain. Paul would go on to say, not for my conscience, but for the conscience of this other person so that they won't think that I'm in line with their wickedness. So I guess one example would be, the ladies are in that session. This is just the one that comes to mind, okay? And so if, um, if carrying a red purse, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But if our society started to remark that carrying a red purse or carrying a black briefcase, if culturally that became the way that people would acknowledge their worship to a pagan deity, then Christians could do that so long as we didn't join in with culture, so long as we didn't, you know, say, hey, we're lining up with them. But in the event that people got the idea that based on our practice, we were going along with them, I believe Paul would say we should refrain. And if there were Christians that were stumbling because of that, hey, you're carrying a black briefcase. All of those guys do that, and they're all in the atheist society. Then it might be better to carry a brown briefcase or to do something to distinguish us. And Paul says, I won't eat meat if it's been sacrificed to idols, if people think that that makes me an idol worshiper. And so we've got to consider what is inherently sinful, what's going to cause someone to stumble, and what's going to affect our influence in the world? At least those are some of the ways I think we should start to answer that. And I thought something else I thought about as they were speaking, I thought about circumcision. You know, at one point, uh, for a Jew, the law of Moses uh, demanded circumcision for, you know, males eight days old to be circumcised, uh, showing a sign of the covenant. But yet in the New Covenant, that is, there is no such obligation for circumcision. Uh, but yet, uh, sometimes, for example, in uh, Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, uh, when it speaks of Timothy working with Paul, Acts chapter 16, verse 1, when um, they came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple there was named Timothy, and the son of a certain Jewish woman, who believed, but his father was Greek. Uh, he was well spoken of by the brethren who are at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go with him, and he took him and circumcised him. All right? But he didn't do it out of a matter of, of salvation or to be right with God. But notice it says, because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And so they knew that he wasn't circumcised, but he was going to work with Paul among Jewish people and they wouldn't give him the time of day if he were not circumcised. And I've never heard a whole sermon on that necessarily from Timothy's aspect, but just think of the sacrifice Timothy made to be circumcised to go work with Paul among those Jews. And uh, if you study church history sometimes, um, Bruce, in fact, I guess both Bruce and Emmanuel teach church history, but Bruce, he's our resident church history guy, restoration included. But, um, you know, some of those guys in the... You know, some of those, we read in the book of Acts of those um, um, pious uh, Greeks that hung around the synagogues because they were interested in the monotheism and all that that was taught there, that one of the reasons, we do have some histor historical data on that, but some, one of the reasons why some of those men did not convert all the way to Judaism is they didn't want to be circumcised. And they knew that was, that's what would, would have been required. And so it's interesting that Timothy was willing to be circumcised to work with Paul, 
But yet in Galatians chapter 2, when it came to circumcision there, uh, Paul refused uh, to have anybody circumcised there because they were making it a matter of religion. In uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 1, then after the 14 years, well, actually, if you begin to verse, well, verse, yeah, verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem uh, with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation, which is an interesting story, went up by, or uh, wording, I went up by revelation and communicated to them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, uh, lest, they, or lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Um, and the, this occurred because false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out the liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us unto bondage to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. And so when they tried to make circumcision a matter of salvation, you had to be circumcised in order to be saved. Paul said, no, we would not put up with that. No, not for an hour, an expression that means no way, not at all, or no way, I was going to say no way, Jose, but that's another expression that, you know, some people might not know. But anyway, uh, there was no way he was going to allow that. And so there's, an, there's a situation where expediency, you know, for the cause, working with the cause, which we could kind of identify as culture, uh, where one was circumcised so he could better effectively bring souls to God, whereas in another situation, one was not even thought about being circumcised because they were making it a matter of salvation. And so that's just another aspect of that. All right, uh, the next question then, and there's actually a couple, some of these kind of go together. Um, two of them go together and one kind of does, but I'll leave it separate. Um, well, actually, let me just do one at a time. All right, now this was handed to me, um, I believe it was during either Doug or Rick's lesson, and so uh, you established so that's who the U is, either Doug or um, Rick Brumbach, but neither one of those are here. They had to get back, so, uh, but we have some others that can answer. But you established that the Bible claims to be inspired, but how do we establish that the Bible is, underlined, is the Word of God without committing the fallacy of circular reasoning? And uh, by circular, I'll just make comments on this, but by circular reasoning, and this is a very common way even brethren try to um, defend the Bible being inspired. They'll say, well, I know the Bible is from God because it says so. And then the other one says, well, how do you know the Bible says so? Or how do you know it's true that the Bible says so because it's from God? And so you have that circular reasoning, or sometimes I call that begging the question. And uh, in my, and, and, actually, and actually, I do want to point out, let's see, that one of the um, yeah, I think, well, one, I think Doug, actually, in his beginning of his lesson, did mention that just because a, a book claims to be from God doesn't mean it is from God, i.e., the Book of Mormon, um, some other, uh, maybe the Quran, other, other things. But just because a book claims to be inspired doesn't mean that it is. But um, when, when I was, well, I, th I think about it. In fact, of course, I thought about, let's see, one of the other lessons talked about learning disabilities and people making excuses sometimes, or maybe that was a discussion at lunch. Maybe that's what it was. But I used to hate reading, D's and F's in school uh, and all that. Uh, but then I became a Christian. And when I became a Christian, this is finally something worth reading, worth studying. And I was diagnosed with all these learning disabilities and all that as a teenager in middle school, late elementary school and all that. And I was given every reason, every excuse uh, not to behave or whatever, even though when I was around, the belt and all that was still in. And so I did kind of behave. But I mean, you know, but once I became a Christian and I found out that Bible's worth studying, guess what? Now my B's and my D's, they all, I can tell them apart now. You know why? Because when you have to memorize memory verses and you write those things down hundreds of times, you get your B's and your D's right, you know? And at least I did. And uh, I became, my, my attention span went just like that, you know, when I, when I became a Christian, because this right here, this is worth studying, this is worth putting forth the effort. And I say all that to say that when I came to preaching school, there were two classes that I took in my Christian walk that really changed my life. 
And the first one of those was Christian evidences. Uh, Jackie Steersman taught that here. And the whole outline of his whole semester was, if we can know truth, if we can know that God exists, if we can know that the Bible is the inspired word of God, then we can know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so that was one class. And another class when I went to Freed Hardeman, but no one here remembers that class. I don't know if Emmanuel, did you go to Freed Hardeman? I don't think you did, but you may have, okay. And this guy named Dr. Hollingsworth, you know, just like the lake over here. But he had this class that was in values, and he played devil's advocate and tried to get us to prove everything we believe, which was really good for me in the long run. But you guys don't know him, so you, anyway. But anyway, I say all that to say that if you say if God exists, and if the Bible is the inspired word of God, there's no circular reasoning in that. And so you can prove, to answer the question, you prove God's existence, first of all, by... Well, fancy word, a priori arguments, which means before, well, anyway, like you have the cosmological argument, you know, before, just that, or just a wording. Uh, and I learned it like this, there's variations of it, but for every contingent effect, there must be an adequate, sufficient cause. All right, contingent means if it's iffy, if it, if it's, if it relies on something else for its existence, then it's contingent. And so someone says, well, where did that tree come from? You say, well, that tree came from a seed. That tree is contingent. Its existence is contingent of a number of things, really, you know, air, water, and all that stuff. But it's contingent. Where did it come from? A seed. Yeah, seed. Where did that seed come from? Another tree. Yeah, you're right, a tree. Where did that tree come from? So eventually, you can't have tree, seed, tree, seed and inf infinitely. That's irrational, illogical. So somewhere there had to be a first cause, an uncaused, sufficient, adequate cause to cause all that, to put all that in motion. And that cause is God. And then you have the teleological arguments about design and designer, the moral argument, one called the ontological argument, but we'll stay away from that just, just for sake of nut, you know, just for fun. But anyway, and so there's all kinds of ways to prove that there has to be a supreme, uncreated first cause. And then when you get that into the Bible, is the Bible the inspired word of God? And then you take the statements and the claims of the Bible and you examine them against that and against itself. And, uh, and of course, to me, and of course, George will probably have some more to say on this, but to me, the, the most sufficient characteristic of Scripture that, you know, that's the one I hone in on is prophecy made and fulfilled. That if you can see, find prophecy in the Bible that's impossible to be fulfilled, other than with supernatural guidance, then uh, you have proven that that has to be the word of God. And so that's just kind of briefly how I would, how I would address that. But we'll leave it open to either George or Forrest or Hiram or Joshua. And I'll just leave the question right there and then uh, for your evaluation. <clears throat> well, a lot of us, um, are following the reasoning that was articulated 20, 30, 35, 40 years ago by Thomas B. Warren. And a lot of us have been using that argument ever since. That includes Jackie Steersman. He got that from Tom Warren. And uh, the argument uh, showing that, that the Bible is the word of God, that is the argument whose conclusion is that the Bible is the word of God that is non-circular is, as he expressed it, and I believe he's got it right, that if, uh, premise number one, if the Bible has property A and property B and property C, dot, 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 and property N, comma, then the Bible is the word of God. Now, can you, uh, is it the case that we can identify a um, conjunction, that is a collection of properties that uh, imply that it must be the word of God? I believe that, the, that we can. Premise number two, the Bible does have property A. Premise number three, that the Bible does have property B, property C, et cetera. Therefore, the Bible is the word of God. Well, what are such properties? Well, one of them would be uh, the fulfillment of, uh, of prediction. Uh, there's quite a bit more to say there. Uh, whether or not that does the job, I believe it does. Um, and, um, and then uh, the unity of the Bible is another. Um, when, you, when you consider the fact that, uh, that there is a, an identifiable 
uh, beautiful scarlet thread, as it were, that weaves its way through the Old Testament scriptures into the New Testament scriptures. Uh, this would include uh, predictions beyond human capacity to fulfill. Um, and uh, and this, these predictions in the unity evident in all of those passages that range way back from Genesis 3.15 all the way into the New Testament, these span about 1,500 years by about 40 different people contributing to these. And they are, um, uh, some of these folks uh, never met one another. There are hundreds of years in between these statements. And furthermore, there is geographical spread. Um, you put all that together, and uh, I believe that uh, there's no way to explain that except uh, such a theme running through the uh, scriptures, such a thread. No way to explain that except by appealing to an intelligence that exceeds the collective uh, intelligences of the uh, mere human writers. So uh, that would be an argument that is not circular. And, uh, and uh, much of that was pointed out by Brother Thomas B. Warren. Let's give credit where credit is due. And a lot of us have been using that argument ever since. Now, with respect to, there is another matter I'd like to add about the, in, with respect to the previous question. And that is uh, the principle found rather in uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 23, where, uh, where you're dealing with, uh, in this case, an optional matter, the idea of eating of meat. You can eat meat or not eat meat um, in a cultural setting and be right with God either way. That's taught in Romans 14 and other passages. But uh, if you are not convinced that it is righteous and you go ahead and do it anyway, that is sin, according to Romans chapter 14, verse 23. Whatever is not of faith is sin. If you're not faith there, meaning trust, confidence. If you're not convinced that it's right and you do it anyway, then you sin. So when in doubt, don't. I think that's also relevant to that first question. And I would also like to, to piggyback on what he was saying there, a thought came to my mind, which was mentioned today earlier about the Bible being inspired in predictive prophecy. Uh, last semester I taught Isaiah Jeremiah, and uh, just think about Isaiah, he lived under the Assyrian period, he prophesied about Babylon and captivity and all that, and he also prophesied about the return, mentioning Cyrus by name at least twice, and Cyrus was 100, 120 or so years or more down the road, and uh, Medo-Persia was just a little spot and wasn't even any kind of world power. And really, for that matter, Babylon wasn't a real big world power at the time when he prophesied about that. But one man, by God's inspiration, prophesied on down. And uh, that would be impossible if it weren't for supernatural guidance. Uh, and then Isaiah is one of the most attacked books. Isaiah and Daniel, I would say, the most attacked books by liberal critics trying to discount God. And you may have heard of Deutero Isaiah or Tri Trito or whatever you want to say. Uh, they try to make Isaiah written up in different authors because they recognize, these academia scholars, some of them, they recognize that, man, he's talking about stuff way outside his ballpark. And so they try to make it a different Isaiah contemporary with that ballpark. But as was mentioned earlier with the Dead Sea Scrolls and all that, we, we discover those in the 1940s, the first ones were began to be discovered, and they go back to about, I don't know, 100 BC, maybe something around in there, but around the turn of the first century, a little before. But um, you know, they show Isaiah as one scroll. Furthermore, Jesus will quote different parts of Isaiah in the same discussion and just call it from Isaiah. And so they know that if they can, that if, that if we can show that there's only one Isaiah, even they, they know, I think, I'm convinced anyway, that there's, there's no explanation for that except the supernatural, except God inspired him, which, of course, we know he did. All right, appreciate those comments. Another one kind of related to it. Um, how can we know and trust the Bible today since we depend on translations? All right, that's a really good one. How can we know and trust the Bible today um, since we depend upon translations? 
All right, well, I'll say a little bit something about that to maybe jog y'all's memory there, and then George can feel free to come up on this as well. Uh, I mentioned this also, that before I came to preaching school, I just told the students this, or somebody this not too long ago, just as an illustration, but before I came to preaching school, the reason what convinced me to be in preaching school is I lived in Louisiana, worked in the oil field, got hurt on the job, and I was, you know, a uh, neighboring congregation. I lived in New Iberia, but between New Iberia and Morgan City, there was a little town there that had a congregation that the church there doesn't exist anymore. That congregation, because I met a guy in, in New Orleans at a lectureship right before the COVID shutdown, he told me all about it. I got notes on it somewhere, and I'll find it and let you know the exact city one day. But anyway, um, so I'm filling in preaching there, mainly because no one else would do it. And that's really how I got started preaching. That's how I got started song leading and everything, because no one else would do it. And they say, will you do it? I was like, yeah, okay. And I'm thinking, my, you bunch of wimps, can't you get up and serve the Lord? And so I do my best and, you know, and that kind of thing. But that's how I got started. So I was filling in there for a couple, couple Sundays, preached my John 3.16 sermon, preached another sermon, and my, my tank was out of gas. And I knew I needed to come to preaching school. And that's what convinced me. I need to go to preaching school. And so I went shortly after that. But I say all that to say that even in those days, and this is why I was telling the students about it, even in those days, before I even came to preaching school, I realized that if I knew that original language and I knew about, more about the historical setting of these books of the Bible, man, I would be so far ahead of the game. Uh, and so that is really what translations of at least the first part of that. And when I came to preaching school, man, I, I said, you were right, Brian, that's right. You were right, and I, and I am, I still am. The more you know about the original language, the more you know about the historical setting of the Bible and the books that were written, the better you are in understanding it, the better we are in studying it, the better we can comprehend and understand it. And so the translation part is right there. We need to realize, in fact, that's what Doug was talking about, and I took his book back, but uh, that little book, and we'll have a lesson, David Steersman was here earlier, and he's gonna give a tremendous lesson based on the chapter of the book on uh, canonicity, which books belong in the Bible, and a great lesson in that. And all these lessons, especially today and some of these other ones, Steve, Steve Atten will talk about translations, I believe, tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, I believe it is. Um, but behind the translation, there is an original language. And that original language in the Bible, we have, man, we've already mentioned a couple times, I think uh, Forrest mentioned this, but we have over 6,000 pieces of evidence uh, that testify to this New Testament. Now, there might be manuscripts, there might be, you know, papyri, vellum, there might be pieces of pottery, there might be, you know, old preacher notes from the second, third, fourth centuries, but all of those pieces of evidence attest to an original. Uh, and those are called, we often call those the autographs. I know Doug mentioned that in his lesson. We, we have no autographs in extant today, in existence today, that is, we cannot go to any museum and find the scroll signed by Paul to the Romans, okay? Uh, but we have better than that. We have pieces of evidence that say Paul wrote Romans. For, I'm just giving that for an example. And I like to compare it. If I said I did something, and I was the only one that said I did something, is that as powerful as if 5,000 people saw me do something and say he did it? Which has more power of proof there? It's not the one, it's the 5,000. And so we have, you know, several thousand pieces of evidence to prove that there had to be an original. You know, if we have a manuscript that ri writes Romans chapter 1 the same way this manuscript over here did, these people didn't know these people, that might be a different little style than this, different culture, but yet it says the same thing, well, there has to be an original somewhere, or there had to be an original written. And that's what we have with it. And so the translations are behind it. Now, some translations are better than others, uh, all translations have their strengths and weaknesses, and I think this was said in uh, the first lesson this morning. There is no, this is the only translation you can use. I don't think that's very biblical. Uh, some translations are better than others, as I said, but a translation seeks to put in, you know, in whatever language is being translated, try to, the best way it can convey the message of that original text. And you know that even in English changes, there's different cultures in English. There's different, you know, different languages. So it's impossible to do a word-for-word -word translation. I say strictly word-for-word. -word, that is 40 one language word, and you can put it in 40 of another language word. That's impossible to do that, uh, especially a document the size of the Bible. 
But, um, and so, so translations do the best they can, and again, there's some strengths and weaknesses in all of them, um, but figures of speech are involved, all kinds of stuff. Like, for example, God forbid in the King James, you know, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we the dead of sin live in Well, that term God forbid, the word God's not in there at all. There's no theos in that, that term. But that expression is, I think literally it's like, let it not be so or something like that. Let it not be so or something. But how do you express that in a, in a culture, in a language? Well, in 1611, God forbid was the way they expressed that. Uh, in our language, it may not be in our culture right now. That might not be it. You know, God forbid might get you in trouble in some places, you know, with the way things are turning. But it means, you know, don't even think about it. Or I heard one guy say, no, not never. But that makes no sense in English. So, you know, we won't use that. But it's, it's an emphatic way of saying, no way. All right, well, can we say that in a different way besides God forbid to still mean the same thing? I think we can. And that, that's kind of kind of what's behind the translations and all that. But know that there is something behind it, and the problem with some of the modern translations are, is not the Greek behind it, speaking of the New Testament, but it's the English in front of it. Uh, and so, you know, so every once in a while, I'll put this in too, you'll see something on Facebook, well, the NIV leaves out Acts 8.38, and so it's the devil's work. Well, ASV 1901 leaves it out too, and Guy and Woods preached from ASV 1901. And that's why I think some people would say that the KJV only or the ASV 1901, when really they're worlds apart. Well, I say worlds apart, not really, but they're different text types, different text behind it, okay? Received text or textus receptus versus what's often called a eclectic text. Uh, Nestle Allen, I guess, would be behind it, UBS, several of them nowadays. Um, but the Greek behind it is a little bit different. But the Greek behind it, and I know Doug Burleson in, in his book or in his lecture, not today, but he, he mentioned this one time that, you know, we're about restoration, right? We want to restore primitive Christ, New Testament Christianity. We want to restore. Well, we, want, we should be interested in knowing what did Paul write. If we had an autograph of Paul, what would it say? And that's what textual criticism is all about. And I kind of joked around with this in the beginning, but this, the title of our book, the, the little booklet that goes along with the lectureship book is called The Lost Chapters of the Lectureship Book. You know, Lost Chapters, and I was kind of kind of trying to be humorous in a situation like this, but, you know, you know, there's talking about the lost books of the Bible. You know, where there are no lost books of the Bible, that's another lesson, I suppose, canonicity, but there are no lost books of the Bible. We got them all right here. Uh, but anyway, but I made, made the mention, we can do textual criticism on this. You know why? Because there are autographs behind this I can I can show them to you. I got them on, my, on my computer if it doesn't crash. But, uh, but we have autographs behind this. I can prove it. Did you know the Book of Mormon? You can't find an autographs. There are no autographs in the Book of Mormon. You can't do textual criticism on the Book of Mormon because you had one guy. Supposedly had three witnesses, but they all recanted at the end of their lives. But you had one guy that says, "I found these gold plates. I translated from these gold plates." No one else did. No one else has seen them. They're not in a museum somewhere. That's just what somebody said. So remember, I say I found these gold plates. No one says they saw me find them. So it's just my word against yours. I wrote this. No, 5,000 witnesses say you wrote it. That's what, what, that's what we have in the Bible. So there, there's a translation behind it. But Yes, to a certain extent, we are dependent upon translations unless we know the original language, but we can know the original language if we apply ourselves. We can study, um, well, yeah, we can study some stuff. I was going to say textual criticism and all that. That's a big fancy word, but all textual criticism does is seek to determine as best we can what is the original. And uh, it's also been mentioned several times that, you know, there's not a single, and a textual, well, I'll say a textual variant is where you have a different manuscripts read differently, and there's no denying that. You can look at those manuscripts in museums, and I, I just like to give the example 1 Corinthians 6.20. Uh, you are bought with the price. Glorify God in your body. And uh, the King James says, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which belongs to God. And there's no denying that some manuscripts end with glorify God in your body. 
And there's no denying some manuscripts end in, and in your spirit which belongs to God. Well, they both can't be right. They both might be wrong. But what did Paul, how, how did Paul end that? Now, shouldn't we be about the business of trying to seek what did Paul in that restoration, what did Paul write? And so there's various things we, or scholars or whatever, textual critics use to try to determine best they can which would have been original, one of which is if it really ended, if it ended in and in your spirit, which are God's, why would anybody erase it? But if it ended in glorify God in your body, why would somebody want to add it? And on that particular one, I believe, of course, I, I check on this, but um, the conclusion is somebody would be more likely to add it than to erase it because much of these manuscripts, especially at certain times, the, the ones that King James were translated from, they were mostly done by Roman Catholics. And they believed in the body, the fle all flesh is evil, only spirit is good. Kind of Gnostics believe that as well, and even people believe that today. Uh, and so to them, it would be impossible to glorify God in your body because it's evil, flesh. And so it would be more likely that they, they would have added that. And then uh, the other thing, you know, which the manuscripts that are closer to the original, they usually carry more weight, kind of like the telephone game. I think somebody mentioned that this morning. If I had a whisper here in Forestry or something and it got all the way around, by the time it got to me back again, it might be a little different than when it started. Well, which is more likely to be more accurate, the closer to me going this way or later on down? And so, you know, by comparison, you know, some, you know, like the KJV, for example, would have been manuscripts, I believe, uh, just read this recently, maybe the nine, eight or nine hundreds AD would be the earliest ones the King James had, and they only had about 25 of them. Uh, but in the late 1800s, several were discovered that go way back to the second and third centuries, closer to the original. And so, uh, but again, even with all of that, the ASV 1901 and KJV are, I think I heard someone say 97 point whatever the same. And there's not a single variant in any of that that's a doctrinal thing. Someone says, oh, well, Mark 16, 9 through 16, whatever. Well, all those verses are taught elsewhere in the scriptures as well. I mean, you know, we don't have to rely upon that for baptism. We got Acts 2.38. We got Romans 6, 3 and 4 and other places like that. But um, anyway, I'm kind of getting a little bit off on that. But, you know, we, we do depend on translations if we don't know the language. But we do realize that there is an original language behind it that we can know. We can study. We can know the manuscripts. We can see them in museums if we want to. We can know a lot of these things uh, if we want to. Um, and I think it's good to compare translations. All right, but let me see. I've probably gone far enough on that. Go, go ahead, Hiram. Uh, and I'm going to leave the question right up here. Say to maybe Brian already alluded to this, but when the text is actually accurately translated, it's a reliable translation. I think sometimes we forget that. If the Greek or the Hebrew is accurately translated, you can trust your English Bible. And so sometimes people say, well, how can we be sure that we actually have the Bible just because it's a translation? Well, there are a lot of pamphlets and things that we sometimes have, maybe in a restaurant or something like that, and they have English on one side and Spanish on the other. The Spanish isn't necessarily inferior. Actually, accurately translate material. And as proof of that, I would just cite that the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. Largely, you've got parts of Esther and Daniel and Aramaic. But by the time we get to the New Testament, Jesus and Paul and others often quote from a translation. They quote from the Septuagint, especially in the book of Hebrews. They often, at will, depending on the wording or whatever they, they choose to by the Holy Spirit, choose to quote from the Septuagint or the Septuagint, and every time they count it as the Word of God. And so Jesus authorizes translations because he quotes from a translation, and it's still the Word of God. And um, I had a grad school professor say this one time about preachers. He was just saying, learn Hebrew, learn Greek, obviously. But we should be careful that we don't give people the impression that they can't have confidence in their English Bible just because it's English. We shouldn't keep saying to people over and over again, well, that's not right because of the Greek or Hebrew. Where the language helps, obviously, we're restorationists. We want to do what's right. But where the English Bible is accurately and faithfully translated, it is the word of God. And so we're not at a disadvantage or it's not inferior to the Greek. 
is to the degree that it's accurately translated, it's still the truth. And that's what I think helps buttress the truth of the Word of God, that God has allowed it to be faithfully preserved, and it can be accurately translated, and everybody doesn't necessarily have to learn Greek to go to heaven, right? That would be difficult. But God in His faithfulness has seen fit that there are trained individuals in linguistics that can do that, but hey, you can get it in English, and you can get it in Spanish or Russian, and you can still know Acts 2.38 and everything else that the apostles taught and make it from earth to heaven. So don't lose faith or confidence in the translation that you have. Just be sure to get one that's faithful to the text. Learn Greek and Hebrew, obviously, if you can. But if you have an English translation, you can read and study it to much profit to the glory of God. And it still is the word of God. So how can we know and trust the Bible today since we depend on translations? This objection has been out there for a long time. This has, and I've, I don't know if I've mentioned this in this lectureship before, I have in others. <clears throat> the, um, this objection um, has zero influence on me. Here's why. I was a technical writer for about 45 years, and uh, that involved my writing uh, detailed procedures, included writing detailed procedures as to how uh, complicated computer systems and uh, software, hardware and software worked. And uh, there were largely two audiences, the users of the product and then the repairers or the maintaining, maintainers of the product. And uh, just give you an example, uh, I wrote several documents that uh, in this particular country that had, uh, a company rather, that had uh, several European offices, uh, Italy, France, Germany, Sweden, as I recall, and, a, and uh, maybe one or two others. And these were translated, these, these documents, these procedures for using these sophisticated hardware products and uh, in some cases software. Uh, these were translated from the English that I wrote into the various target languages that I just mentioned. Uh, it's interesting, by the way, that German, the page count on the German translation was always longer. It was about 25% longer than the English page count uh, that I wrote originally. Uh, and these uh, recipients of these translations were able to use the equipment from the translation of what I wrote and were able to maintain and repair the equipment. So it's doable. Sure, it takes work to uh, translate correctly, but uh, uh, there's a good example that you might want to cite where uh, people were able to uh, get the job done from translations. So uh, I, again, this, has th this objection that sometimes liberals will throw at us has zero influence on me from my experience. All right, and uh, well, let me just say a couple things. Well, just one, just uh, an example of how translations can be messed up is we were in Africa doing some work. And I don't know if that's a trip you were on, Hiram, or not, but at the end of, uh, we spent a week in this one village here teaching with Bob Bauer and his crew. And um, the very last day, we found out that the local translation actually translated baptism with putting water on your head. And so it's like, whoa. And we didn't have a whole lot of baptisms that trip. Couldn't figure out why, but that might have been one of the reasons. Because, you know, putting water on your head is not the same thing as scriptural baptism, but that's how they translated it. And so I would kind of add the major translations, okay? <laughs> yeah. Uh, like the King James, New King James, ESV, ASV, New American Standard, those major translations, right on. And then also the world, New World Translation put out by the Jehovah's Witnesses, I've seen this evolving in just in my lifetime. Makes it sound like I'm an old guy, but anyway. You know, used to say Colossians 1.15, uh, you know, Christ made, uh, let's see, how's it go? Oh, someone refresh my memory, how's it go? Colossians 1.15. And all things, as before that, oh yeah, all things were made by him, all other things. Anyway, all other things. 
They, and they added the word other in there. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made, but they added the word other. And they have it in, they have it in um, parentheses now. All other things in parentheses. Because they know that if he made all things and they say he was created, he had to make himself. So they put other in parentheses. Well, I guarantee you, in my lifetime, I can't guarantee because I don't know how long I'll live, but if I live to be, you know, 90 or 100 or 80, whatever, I'm guaranteed they're going to take those brackets off of that and they're just going to say all other, as if that's what the text reads. But that's not what, there's no manuscript anywhere that has other in there that I know of. Uh, but they might invent one, so be, be aware of that. All right, one final question. And also, Guy and Woods, if you have his, if you have his commentary on 1 John, 1 John in the Gospel Advocate series, uh, 1 John 5, verses 7 and 8, where it talks about the Trinity or whatever, or Lee, mm, well, yeah, 7 and 8 or 17 and 18, but 1 John 5, 7 and 8. You read his commentary on that, and he will give you a crash course in textual criticism as to why that verse doesn't, well, actually, part of the verse, anyway, he'll give you good stuff on that. And nobody that I know of would call Guy Woods a flaming liberal, okay? Uh, at least anybody that ever knew him. But yet he, he tells you why it doesn't belong in there. All right, but anyway, this last question here, uh, it says, again, repeat, please. But this, this deals with Rick Brumbach's lesson on 1 Peter 1, 20, 21. But it says, since 1 Peter 1, 20, 21 teaches the scripture of no interpretation, how can we be sure we today can understand it? Also on this basis, Catholics say we need the hierarchy of the Catholic Church to get the Bible interpretation right. Okay, and that's the, the I guess, one question and a statement on that. But I do, uh, Rick did mention something of that uh, in here in his lesson. But um, as he said, the private interpretation, uh, remember he gave the two parts of communication. You have the speaker and the receiver. And uh, we usually take that interpretation to be the receiver. He's not allowed to interpret any way he wants to. But I think Rick pointed out, rightly so, that that no interpretation is on the speaker's part. He gets it. It's not his own. It's not from him that it's coming, but it's from the Holy Spirit, the prophecy of Scripture. That's where it's coming from. And so the, and, and, and I think he did say the interpretation is kind of maybe not the best of translations. What, what does the ESV have on that? Do you know? So no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. Oh, sorry. Keep, no keep reading. All that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Okay, comes from someone's own interpretation. Okay. Yeah, it comes from. It doesn't come from his interpretation. And so um, it is, it's there. I mean, it's, it's from God. Okay, uh, and so let me, let me, so someone will make a comment on that. Okay, yeah, George would, and I was going to say something too, but. George will have to say something. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And notice, I'm reading from the New King James here. Notice the, um, this is the situation where we have the woman at the well, as you recall. Jesus uh, met this woman at the well. And uh, let's see, it talks about a woman of Samaria, verse 7, came to draw water. Jesus saw to her, give me a drink. No, no, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Notice that. A woman of Samaria, verse 7 of John 4, came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, why did he ask her to give him a drink? Verse 8, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So as, uh, as, as was pointed out in that good lesson uh, by, what's his first name? Uh, Rick. Rick, Brother Rick. Um, the word for here in the original is G-A-R in the Greek, gar, which introduces an explanation of what was just said. So verse 8 in John 4 is an explanation of verse 7. Okay. You have that, by the way, in John 3.16. John 3.16, when we hear people say, uh, I may have somebody, uh, Wayne, 
John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Would you quote that for us? Can you? Probably won't, but. Try it. <laughs> try it. Uh, for God so loved the world. Okay, now. Right, so notice how a lot of us quote that. For God so loved the world. You, you hardly hear the word for. I advise us to say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Verse 16 is an explanation of verses 15 and preceding. And verses 15 and preceding refer back to the Old Testament scriptures account back there where you have an obedient faith demonstrated. And so it's an obedient faith that's in mind, an obedient belief. And then verse, uh, then you have verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, our only unique son, his, his unique son, we can talk about that, uh, that um, those who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Belief, have faith in him. That's an obedient faith as demonstrated by the fact that verse 16 of John 3 is an explanation of a preceding passage Reference back to the Old Testament, which is talking about an obedient faith. Okay. So keep that in mind. For, John 3.16, is an explanation for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Same thing here, John 4, uh, verse 8. For, F-O-R, gar, and introducing an explanation of what was just said. All right, now go over to that passage. 2 Peter 1, 20, 21. 2 Peter chapter 1. 20 to 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. So is this saying, is this referring to the writers of the Bible or the readers of the Bible? Um, the Catholics take this to, to, to be, to, for the private interpretation to be referring to the readers of the Bible. And they're saying that you can't just privately as an individual go to the scriptures and understand it. You have to have the help of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church to get it right. right? But they're taking that, and I have quotations on this, they're taking that to read the private interpretation of 2 Peter 1.20 to be referring to the, reader, to the readers of the writer. But verse 21 proves that the private interpretation is talking about the writers of the Bible. Notice that, because it has the word for, same word, G-A-R. That is, it's introducing an explanation of what was just said. If you want to know if the readers or the writers of the Bible are in mind in verse 20, go to verse 21. For, explaining that now, explaining verse 20, prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So verse 21 is a clincher, as evidenced by the word F-O-R here. It is an explanation of verse 20, giving rise, we give rise to the question in verse 20, is the private interpretation a matter of uh, referring to the readers of the Bible or the writers of the Bible? Verse 21 proves that it is referring to the writers of the Bible, not the readers of the Bible. Excellent, very good. And I always saw that verse 21, not by, but by. Not by the will of man, but by the Holy Ghost. Good stuff, man. So glad to have George in our back pocket over here. <laughs> no, no, but uh, good to have him here. All right, um, that, yeah, that's all the questions we have, right about good timing there. Uh, Want to remind us of the program tonight at 6.30. Actually, 6.25, well, 6.30, we'll begin congregational singing. Yeah, we'll do it at 6.30 tonight, but we might have to make it a little bit earlier. But why I say that is if uh, some of the young fellows, if they want to get us warmed up by leading a song up here, they can do that. Um, and so definitely, uh, if these three are here want to, they got first dibs because they're here during the question and answer period, okay? <laughs> but anyway, uh, we'll have a congregational singing at 6.30 tonight. And uh, what we'll do there, if you're, not, if you're new to the lectureship, we'll have, if you're a faithful brother in Christ, would like to lead a song, please sit on the front pew, and we'll start at one end and go down the other. If you want to lead a song at 6.30 to help for singing, so we'll do that at 6.30, and that'll take us into 7 for our lesson tonight. Two lessons tonight, uh, looking at the wrong day here, but that's okay. 
Uh, tonight we have at 7 o'clock, yeah, the 7 o'clock period all across the board on the lectureship. Uh, BC Carr set that up a long time ago when he, we started the lectureship, I believe in 1975. This is our 46th annual. I'm not good at math, so you can figure that out, but I believe it's 1975 or 76 maybe we started the lectureship. And he always left that 7 o'clock spot, the first evening session, for a uh, either graduate or alumnus of the School of Preaching. And so all the way across the board, that's what we'll have at 7 p.m. Tonight is Vince Doherty, and uh, this lectureship, all the lessons at 7, will be coming out of Psalm 119, largest chapter in the Bible, uh, kind of the middle chapter in the Bible, really. I think, well, anyway, I think so, but actually... My middle chapter was Second Chronicles something, but that's just me, you know. <laughs> all right? In my, my large print Bible. But anyway, uh, all the way across the board. Now, Jeff Jenkins uh, will not be here. Uh, he actually uh, contacted me last night, well, late yesterday afternoon, right before I called Bruce Doherty right there, who's going to fill in that slot. He's going to speak on the same subject, uh, cheerful words, John 16, 33. And I thought it'd be pretty cool to have Vince and Bruce back to back. Uh, a couple years ago, we had Emmanuel in on it. We called it the three D's right there, three daughters. And uh, we had them speak on our VBS program, did a great job. And I'm sure Brother Emmanuel, he's still up to that. If, so if you want a good VBS, get those three guys right there, 3D. Uh, but Bruce will fill in for uh, Jeff tonight. Uh, Jeff hadn't been, well, he actually called me a couple days ago, so I got Bruce on the on standby a couple days ago. He wasn't feeling well, but he wasn't sure it was a COVID or not, but he was going to wait a couple days to see how he felt. But he since got tested, and people around him got tested. And so for sure, one of his close, close associates uh, was tested positive, so he's going to stay home. We're glad of that. Uh, we hope if he does have COVID, his symptoms remain kind of mild. But uh, he won't be here this time, and so Bruce will fill in him for tonight. And uh, yours truly will be there tomorrow, uh, that would be me, at 1050, the Word of God under fire. Uh, and so that's one change we'll have uh, for the lectureship. There'll be some others that I'll announce as we go along. But we'd invite you back tonight. Uh, great lessons, always good. Just kick it off at the 630 singing. And so we'll have those lessons tonight, and we look forward to that. Also, uh, Sister Flo Duffy, uh, her husband and I started preaching school in 1989 at the same time. And her husband was on the five-year plan, Eddie Duffy. Well, I don't think anybody in here knew him. Okay, Bruce, all right. You're like me, old-timers, okay? But anyway, but uh, Eddie was a good man. Uh, in fact, he was the first real personal worker. I could say that when I think of Ed, Ed Duffy, I think of a personal worker. He was always teaching people the Bible, uh, baptized several people. Some of those uh, turned out to be preachers. Uh, and so he did a really good work, but he was on the five-year plan. I was on the two-year plan when I came, and so I graduated before him, but we were good friends for many years. He passed away in 2002. Uh, Flo is kind of our adopted grandmother. Uh, she doesn't do diapers, and that's okay. We have no diapers anymore anyway, but uh, she's close to the family, but her brother or brother-in-law died uh, yesterday, I believe it was, or this morning, passed away. She wants us to remember uh, her and her family in prayer. And she was just out there visiting them over the uh, Christmas holidays. And so uh, we're going to include her in a prayer here in just a moment. But we would uh, ask you again, invite you back tonight. And also, if you can help us defray the cost of the lectureship, uh, even though it's during the COVID crisis and you know, our numbers may not be as much as they are in other years, and our traveling expenses won't be as much for sure, but we still have expenses. We still need your help. If you can help defray the cost, we would much appreciate it. You can give us donations. We've also opened it up online as well that you can, because uh, a lot of people won't be here, but they'll be listening online. So if you'd like to donate uh, to help us uh, through PayPal or through uh, a debit card or something, we'd much appreciate that. All right, we're going to close with a brief word of prayer. Uh, also, I do want to remember, I uh, do, do want to mention, in fact, all three of these guys were on standby, still are, I guess. And Hiram and Joshua, for sure, are going to preach extra lessons during this lectureship. And Joshua, uh, he's got his preaching shoes on, and he's going to preach again Thursday night, uh, where Melvin Ote usually closes us out, and Joshua's going to preach that for us. So we're going to keep him in mind. Of course, Hiram will have his same spot before that, so we'll have double the action. Uh, Forrest is on standby, but we think his guy on standby is going to be here. So uh, we'll have to get them too next year, but you know we'll we'll 
we appreciate him being on standby anyway. All right, so uh, let's close with a prayer. Uh, be back at 6.30 for the congregational singing, 7 o'clock for the, well, we'll try to do announcements a little bit before 7, but give our speakers time. But we'll start the evening program officially at 7 and uh, congregational singing at 6.30. Let us go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for the time you've given us here to study your word through these questions and answers. Uh, hopefully, Father, we have continue to have a hunger and thirst for your word, and then we'll study some of these issues on our own so that we can better understand your will for us and what we, we can do to please you and, and how we can continue to attain forgiveness and be the most effective servant for you that we can. Father, we pray that you be with the family of Flo Duffy as she mourns and they mourn the loss of their loved one. Pray that you will comfort them and point them to you that as they take comfort in the scriptures and as we, as your, as your, your family, as your brother, as your, as your church, as we encourage one another, that we will point people to the hope that lies in your son, Jesus Christ, and your will for us through him. We pray that you be with us now as we depart, as we take a break uh, from the lectureship, that you'll keep us safe, and that you'll continue to keep us safe throughout this lectureship. We thank you, Father, for so many brethren who have expressed their interests and their prayers, and we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to have this study together these four days. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
us up for singing. Uh, you can come up here. I know Ellis is probably going to be in on that. I don't know if KJ's into that kind of stuff. Andre might be. I don't know. But if you want to come to the front, sit down up front, and uh, we will start with that. And then, uh, if you would like to lead a song, Richard is going to start us off. And so if you'd like to sit uh, on that pew there first, and then you can fill up this pew on both sides of the tripod, but don't knock that tripod around. Uh, you might get knocked around yourself. But, uh, and so lead up a song. What we'd like for you to do after we get to pass the young fellows, uh, just state your name. Like, come to the microphone, state your name, and what song. And then sometimes it works better to stand out there to, to lead it. And so we'll start out with Ellis. And uh, anyone else, the young fellows that want to start us out? Oh, yeah. Say your song. One, 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 we're marching to Zion for those online.
Very good. All right. <laughs> All right. That was excellent. That was excellent. And so we'll, we'll do this every night. We'll start off with the young fellows that will warm us up. And then we'll start here with Richard and go down this way. And I was thinking when Ellis was up there, hey, maybe one day we can do a 4D program. How about that, brothers? Okay. So we'll start with Richard. And then uh, if we need to, we can loop back around again, and that'll be no problem. And if you'd like to lead a song with students or whoever, uh, get in the rotation. We'll be good. All right, Richard. Number 833. 833. We'll sing all three verses. There's a message truth and glad for a simple and sad.
Song number 515. Song 515. Zion and Glory Song. On Zion's glorious summit stood one who wrestles with him by blood. They him their king in strength, he divine. I heard the song and strove to join. I heard the song and strove to
672, 672, my name's Kyle Smith. I attend the Orange Street Congregation. 672. Let us sing. There's a holy and beautiful city built together and the Lord is God. John saw it descending from heaven when that was in his eye of his rod. His high massive wall is a jasper. The city itself is pure gold. And when my crowd's enter is folded, mine eyes shall its glory behold.
make it go what way to the minister. Skies are blue, you are king's blue. In your days of wrestling, great all the holy crew. There's a silver light that shines in the heavenly land. Look thy way and see thy friend, trust in his promises, friend. Sing and he happy. He happy.
That's all right. Be on the bench, 6.30 tomorrow night. Actually, tomorrow night is going to be 6.15 for the singing, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. Uh, but normally it's 6.30. All right. But anyway, we welcome you to our first evening session of the 46th Annual Florida School of Preaching Lectureship. And the theme in lessons uh, geared toward the youth, arguments against the Bible answered, how to keep in the Bible and stay in the Bible, and how does the culture affect doctrine. I did not listen personally, but I hear the ladies' class went well. We appreciate Brittany Kemp uh, for doing that for us. And uh, that was recorded um, on, uh, well, we'll have some YouTube links to that later. And we're going to try to make the next Thursday, uh, two, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, we're going to try to make that live somehow uh, for those that want to watch it live or in person. Uh, but we are working on that. And uh, we do have a way. We just didn't think about it then. At least I don't think we thought about it then, but we'll see about the next one. But we appreciate all those who have been here and have traveled and appreciate our speakers and those tonight who participated in the congregational singing. Tonight we have a great program lined up. Uh, we're first going to start out with, in just a moment, I guess I'll introduce the, the speakers in just a moment, but uh, let me just say a little bit about the program uh, tonight, and then we'll have an opening prayer. Brother Alfred Woodard will lead us in that prayer. He is a 2005 graduate of Florida School of Preaching, and he is, and actually he, uh, when he was going to school, he actually commuted from um, Deltona uh, every day, and uh, so that's, uh, that was a sacrifice. Uh, he's around here somewhere. He's going to lead prayer. Yeah, that was a sacrifice. And he is encouraged because if he can do it, other people can do it as well. And I've mentioned him to others who had to drive in. And so he's going to lead us in a prayer. He is currently preaching in De Quincey, Louisiana. And uh, so we, he will lead us in an opening prayer. But I just want to mention before he does that, that uh, I mentioned this earlier, that as preachers, we know that when we prepare a sermon, it doesn't matter if there's one person that shows up or 300 people that show up. We're still going to put the same preparation into it, hopefully, that we would otherwise anyway. And so that's the same with this lectureship. No matter how many people attend, there's still some costs that we put forward that, to have the lectureship. And we've done this every year. Obviously, our travel expenses this year will be a little bit lower due to some of the speakers that canceled. In fact, tonight's speaker uh, was originally scheduled for Jeff Jenkins, but Bruce Doherty will fill in for him, preaching on the same subject. And that is pretty awesome because his son is preaching right before him, and uh, we couldn't get Emmanuel in, but Emmanuel will lead us in our closing prayer tonight at the end of services, so we'll have sort of a 3D. Those of us at South Florida Avenue remember when they did our VBS about three years ago, four years ago maybe, and we had a great time with that and learned a lot of Bible uh, at the same time. But if you're going to help to defray our expenses, we'd appreciate that. We do have online options now that you can give online. Uh, but every year, our lectureship guests have seen the value of this lectureship, and they have supported it, and we have broken even, or maybe just a little above most years that I can think of, and that's a signal to turn this on. And, of course, if you're relying on me, uh, well, I think I'm pushing the right button. Oh, there it is. Um, I might miss it, so thanks for the reminder. But anyway, if you could help us defray costs, uh, we'd much appreciate that. We do not charge any kind of tuition or any kind of registration fee. Uh, it's our gift to the Brotherhood, but if you can help us out with that, we much appreciate it. And so, um, and also giving online. All right, before I introduce our speakers, um, well, let me introduce Vince first. But we're going to ask Al to lead us in a prayer right after I introduce him. And so right after Amen, uh, Vince will be our speaker. He currently serves as the associate minister here. Uh, in fact, him and Hiram basically, well, well, if it weren't for COVID, they'd preach about the same amount of time here with uh, Hiram traveling a lot, but, you know, that hadn't been the case lately, but he does preach at least once or twice a month, does a great job with our young people, and uh, he uh, is also a graduate of the Florida School of Preaching, 2019, right, or 18, 18, 19, 19, okay, 2019 graduate of the Florida School of Preaching, and so he will have our lesson tonight on Psalm 119, Words for God's Word. And if you see those 7 o'clock sessions, they're all alumnus, graduates of the school. And this year, all those tracts of lessons are on Psalm 119, different aspects of that. And after the prayer by Al Woodard, uh, Vince will show us there's different words that all refer to the Word of God in that psalm. And he's got a really big lesson. 
but I know he'll give us a, a good job on that. And so Al will lead us in prayer, and then Brother Vince Dillon. Let us pray. Our great and glorious God, we are so grateful for all the things you have bestowed upon us, Father. Father, we appreciate the opportunity we have to come and study your word and listen to these lectures concerning your word and your inspiration. Father, we know that you are an awesome and powerful God and that you are a loving God and that not only did you love us so much that you gave your son for us, you gave us your word so that we could know how to live pleasing to you and that one day we can have a home with you. Father, we pray for those who are ill and we pray for those who may be suffering from various diseases, including this COVID. We pray for the minorities that are suffering within our government, the things that are going on in this land and in this world. Father, all these things serve to remind us that we live in a lost and dying world, and the only thing that can cure that cancer is your word. Father, we pray that we will be able to use the things we learned this week and that we remind us and recharge us to go forth and be soldiers in your kingdom and to preach your word and spread your gospel, to show people the need that they have to be saved, that this life is temporary, Eternity is forever, and a home with you is the most precious thing that we can gain. Father, we thank you for the school here. It has done many good works over the last 40-plus years, I think 50 years. Father, we thank you for those who continue to serve it. We thank you for Brian and his family, the leadership that they bestow as director, the instructors who take their time to help students grow and Ted and the board that continues to serve. Father, we personally are grateful for the opportunity we've had to come and study your word at this school. We thank you, Father, for the providence you had in delivering it to us and to those future generations that can study here. Father, we pray that this school will long serve your kingdom. We pray, Father, that the people who speak this week will be watched over by you and that these messages will be of your word and we know that they will for they come from your word. Father, you are a great and glorious God and we thank you, Lord, for everything that you do for us. We thank you especially for that word that we know is through your inspiration that the writers can get wrote it out of your will, giving us your will. Forgive us, Father, for our wrongdoings and watch over and care for us and remind us to always be of a humble and repentative nature and a servant of yours. May we one day hear that great sound of your word saying, welcome, thou good and faithful servant. Father, we pray that we, as we go through this night, we'll remember that we are your servants. In Christ's holy name we do pray. Amen. Since uh, studying and preparing for lecture here in, on Psalm 119, I came across this uh, verse, Psalm 99, and Psalm 19, 119 verse 99 says, I have more understanding than all of my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. Who knew that you could skip out on two years of hard work at the Florida School of Preaching just, uh, just study for Psalm 119? <laughs> Well, the next verse, it says that he knows more than the ancients, so I think maybe that's talking about Bob Bauer. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, all, all in good fun. The topic I want to introduce tonight is Psalm 119, and I want to give a overview style of the psalm, and I want to give you uh, this psalm by emphasizing the words and the different Hebrew words that are used when uh, the psalmist writes this psalm. The
letters that are on the page. He sees straight lines and he sees squiggled lines. And as that child develops in their cognitive abilities, they start to see how these squiggly lines and straight lines come together. And they can come together and form together words. And you put those words together and string out those words, and they become things that you can read. And they don't just uh, represent uh, black ink on a page. They uh, mean something more than just what's there. And it's a beautiful thing when you see that child start to grasp it. And then you can't hardly get them to stop. But when we think about God and his word, those same squiggly lines mean something so much more, doesn't it? It's not just words on a page. It's not just ink that uh, is spilled, and there's a lot of ink spilled on Psalm 119. It becomes something more than that. In a sense, those lines and squiggles are taken by the Holy Spirit who move holy men of God, and he, they speak God's word, and they write down God's word. You can read and you can study and look to try to apply Psalm 119, and it's not an easy task. It's kind of an enigma in and of itself. It's like the miniature book of Psalms in and of itself. It's like the miniature Bible in and of itself. But when you look at Psalm and Psalm 119 with the rest of Scripture, it's not like any other book you've ever read. It's not one where you pick up, you read through it once, and you consume it, and you go away. The Word is a lifetime of study that you keep going back and you keep ruminating, you keep meditating, you keep ingesting it. And what happens when you keep coming back to it and you keep coming back to it, you start to pick it up and you start to see it in different lights. It becomes this jewel. It becomes this diamond, this multifaceted diamond that you hold in your hand. And if you look at it in one way and in one light, you can see some beauty there. But if you can pick it up and rotate it just a little bit, you see a little bit more. You rotate it just a little bit more and you see a little bit more. You rotate it a little bit more and again and again and again and again. That's what Psalm 119 is all about. This guy picks up the word of God and he sees all the greatness of who he is, what he's done what he's promised in his word and he keeps rotating it just a little bit more he looks at applying it just a little bit more and he is in awe of who god is and so he just keeps writing he keeps writing and praising and praising and writing and praising and writing and praising and writing he gets to the end and look at the very last verse Look at the very last verse. He says, uh, I'm, I'm like a sheep who's gone astray. He says, seek me, for I do not forget your commandments. It doesn't read any different than any other line. It just seems like the next line, and he's going to write again. He's at Tau. He's at the end of the letters that he knows. There's no more Hebrew letters. I'm sure if there were more Hebrew letters, he would have kept writing. What does that tell you about God's word? It's beyond the comprehension of our language. I could do it in Hebrew. You could do it in Greek. You could do it in English and start at A and go all the way through. You're not going to exhaust it. And that's the realization that he found in God's word. It's interesting that various faithful men of God are told to ingest scrolls from time to time. By ingesting those scrolls and consuming those words, the Bible is trying to show us that it will, in turn, sustain us. Jesus says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4 and verse number 4. One preacher said he often gets appeals from relief organizations with pictures of starving children from poverty-stricken areas around the world. 
And it's sad when we think about how much food that is in this world that could feed them. But if God were to take a snapshot of our nutrition, would he see bellies that are sunken and gaunt in a spiritual sense? Seeing people that fail to ingest the life-giving word that is in them. There should never be a lack of spiritual nutrition. We live in a place that everybody has a Bible. He says that if there is spiritual malnourishment, the problem is motivation. The psalmists, from time to time, try to help with that motivation. In Psalm 34, in verse number 8, the psalmist says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Try it, you'll like it. In Psalm 119, verse 103, the psalmist says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Appreciate that excellent word from God's word. And one thing was he was talking, and of course, um, I think about when he's talking about the inexhaustiveness of God's word. You know, a lot, of, a lot of times at yard sales and stuff, you'll see books out there for sale. You have used paperback books and all that by the dozens. And because, you know, if you read a novel, you know, you've read it, you've got it, get it, got it good, it's on the shelf and collects dust and you sell it. Now, I, I know sometimes, I don't know, I'm not an avid reader except when it comes to Bible and Bible stuff, but you can go through a second time, like Harry Potter was a big thing a couple years ago, and so there's a lot of intricacies in those, and every time you watch a movie, you see something different. Uh, and so there may be some of that in a limited way with books, human books. You read them, you read them again, you get something else out of it, but there comes a point where you don't get anything else out of it. But that's not so with the Bible, is it? I mean, you can study that for a lifetime and still... Like the psalmist in Psalm 119 that Vince brought out, stand in awe of God and his creation, his, his, his doctrine, uh, everything about it is just wow. And so we appreciate Vince reminding us of that. Unfortunately, his chapter is one of the lost chapters of the lectureship book, but we found it, and it's right here in this little book. And uh, the way I organize the lectureship book, we have the sections together. And so these, all these 7 o'clock sessions are uh, Psalm 119. And so that's the section that got zapped. And a little bit of Kyle Butts, uh, which was a section right before it. But we do have that available in this supplemental thing. That, so whenever you buy a book, this comes with it at no extra cost. And so it's right there. Um, but there was a, something with the manufacturing of the book that went wrong. Uh, but the PDF is still available. We have those books available on PDF, and the PDFs are advantageous because it contains all the books, even the ones that are out of print. We also have The Harvester, our monthly publication, I believe from 1994 all the way up to the end one of uh, 2020. And so that's a good source. It's all searchable, and it's all there for you, so you can take the lectureship home with you. All right, at this time, we're going to ask Brother Tim Simmons, who's been leading singing for us all day, he is a member of the Board of Directors, and he is a, well, he's a member down at Port Charlotte now, recently relocated. He used to serve as an elder in Venice, and a good brother to have on hand. And so he will lead us in a song. If you'd like to stand for the singing of this song, please do so. Then I'll two, three, for the invitation song. And once you have uh, 23 marked in your book, Go ahead and turn to 583, 583, sing to me of heaven, 583.
If you're tuning into the lectureship tonight to hear Jeff Jenkins, uh, we hate to disappoint you for the speaker, but we do have a great lesson coming up on that same topic. Uh, Jeff notified me a couple days ago that he wasn't feeling well, didn't think it was COVID, but he didn't want to take any chances. So he's going to play it by ear for a couple days. And then he texted me or contacted me last night, uh, late afternoon, uh, saying that he got tested, but his, I don't think his results have come back yet. But one of his close associates that he inter, inter, interacts with every day did test positive. And so uh, he decided to stay back, and we're glad of that. And so, but uh, that's just the nature of what's going on this year with the lectureship. But uh, we're thankful to have Bruce Doherty with us. And uh, we, uh, every local church and, you know, spiritual-minded organization would do well to have a, a brother like Bruce on hand. And so I saw Vince right there, and I thought, well, how great that would be to have Bruce, his dad, speak right after him. And so I uh, actually gave, gave him a heads up a couple days ago and then called him up last, last, yesterday afternoon for sure to say, you're on my brother, and he's got his preaching shoes on, so he's going to preach tonight, and he's also going to fill in uh, Thursday at 2 p.m., destroyed for a lack of knowledge, but we'll have more to say about that. As we go along. Did I say Tuesday? Thursday is what I meant to say, Thursday at 2 p.m., but I'll say something about that later. But uh, Bruce uh, preached at Bevel Road Church of Christ in Daytona Beach for 10 years, and then he went to Ohio for 10 years, and then he came back, and he's been back about five or six. Ten. Wow. Time flies when you're having fun, and let me tell you, I'm having all kinds of fun, and time is really flying. But So he's been back 10 years, so he's got the three decades right there. But he's a great guy. I knew him before he went to Ohio, taught at the school then, came back after 10 years and teaches at the school now. He'll be teaching uh, restoration history this semester. He and his dad both are very active teaching uh, Bible class for West Virginia School of Preaching Online. And actually, Vince and Bruce also have a podcast uh, about church history, and it's, it's, it's in the, well, actually, yeah, he's one of the missing links, actually, the missing chapters, but I forget the name of that. What's the name of that again? It's about church history. The Persistence of Christian the Memory. The Persistence of Christian Memory. The Persistence of Christian Memory, and so look for that podcast we shared on the SFA uh, page, and there's other places where you can get a hold of that, and it's very good, very interesting, very timely, but Bruce is going to deliver some message, and you'll see the 740 uh, comforting, cheerful words, and these are basically verses in the New Testament that emphasize something about the Word of God. And so the cheerful word is what we have tonight, and Bruce uh, is going to give us that lesson. And so let's give, us, let, let us give him our attention tonight, Brother Bruce. Now I know what a pinch hitter in baseball feels like. You're under the gun, and you hope you can deliver. I'm glad to be with you. I'm very thankful that Brian has called on me. I'm wishing I could hear Jeff Jenkins, and I'm sure you wish you could hear Jeff Jenkins as well. We pray that he will be well physically and that he will uh, soon be able to resume his, uh, his speaking and his ministry, and so we pray for Jeff tonight. But we are thankful that uh, we can be here. Glad to be on the program with my son, Vince. Uh, it's a good thing. Uh, Brian mentioned just before that we have the podcast that we've started. I didn't even know what a podcast was till Vince said, let's do one. And uh, it is a, a podcast that is wrapped around the idea that church history and restoration history still is very relevant for us today. And we draw from stories and examples and readings and other kind of things and try to make an application of how it can apply today. So I encourage you that if you have time in your very busy week, tune in to this work of collaboration that Vince and I do as we converse about church history and restoration history. I also uh, want to acknowledge other important people who are here tonight. My parents, Emmanuel and Judy Darty, are here. Uh, and uh, as uh, Brian has mentioned, uh, we've done a program where Dad, Vince, and I have all been on the lectureship together. We call it the Gospel in 3D. Other people called it the good, the bad, and the ugly. But uh, anyway, we're glad that, that I'm especially glad my parents can be here. They're my heroes. 
also glad that my wife can be here and Vince's wife and, uh, and then the, the real joys of our life are grandchildren. Two of the three that we have are here tonight and we're thankful for that. Brethren, this has been a great day for me. I don't know what it's been for you, but it's been a great day for me, and it helps me to know this is what I've been missing for this whole last year when we couldn't assemble and be together and be encouraged and all the good things that we've had. And I want to thank Brian for persisting and carrying through and persevering and saying, we're going to do this anyway. And I'm thankful that we can do that tonight. And uh, again, it's been a great boost for me, and I hope it's the same for you. Cheerful words. What Jesus spoke of in John chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus had been sharing with his disciples and Jesus told them, these things that I have spoken to you so that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. It is these cheerful words that we want to notice and I'm going to uh, restrict myself uh, tonight to the special um, portion of scripture that we find in John chapter 13 through 17. John has been called the gospel of belief and this morning one of our speakers talked about the word pistueo or faith and belief and how many times it appears in the gospel of John and in chapters 1 through 12 of John there is the book of signs as uh, these signs are written so that you might believe. But when we turn and pass in the transition then from the book of signs to the book of glory in the book of John, in chapters 13 through 17, there is a unit here that Jesus shared with his disciples on the night in which he was betrayed. Here are chapters that are unique to the gospel of John. And here we find material that the other gospel writers for the choices that God made did not have them include in their gospel accounts. And brethren, we need to see and understand here, these are important chapters because they are a prelude and a, uh, a setting of the tone, so to speak, of what's going to come as Jesus will go to his impending betrayal and crucifixion. And of course, his resurrection. And brethren, it is here that we find each and every word with the pall of the shadow of the cross over these words. And so we want to look at this tonight, and even though the shadow of the cross lingers and hovers and colors every part of this, it is the shadow of the cross that helps us to understand the words of good cheer that Jesus wanted us to know. And so let's notice a few things here in John chapter 13. First of all, about the context of these cheerful words. The context, of course, is trouble. And it is a trouble that's brought on because Jesus is letting his disciples know, I'm going away. The Bible says here in John chapter 13 and verse 1, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come. And again, when you study in the earlier chapters of John, you find that little word, the hour, the hour. And Jesus, uh, throughout that time, the Bible says his hour had not come. Come. And Jesus himself says, mine hour has not yet come. But now the hour is here. It's that appointed time. It's not a literal 60 minutes. It's not a chronological kind of thing. But it is about the appointment that God has made for his son to go to the cross for you and me. And so the hour has come. But Jesus Knowing that he would depart from this world, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And so Jesus is telling his disciples of his departure. You like to say goodbye. I don't. I have one son who lives up in Chicago, and every time we would have to say goodbye when we were at Grandma and Grandpa's, he would run and hide. He didn't want to have to do that. I've got a little grandson, he's the same way now when his dojo leaves. Brethren, Jesus was saying goodbye. And this caused a context of trouble for his disciples. 
In John chapter 14, Jesus said to let not your heart be troubled. He can see it on their faces. He knows what they're uh, thinking and feeling and going through as after this ministry of three years and all the things that they've had together, this ministry is now coming to a close and it's going to come to a very violent close. And their hearts are troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me, Jesus says. And so his departure is a time of sadness. It is in a context of trouble. And these disciples that we find here are troubled. But brethren, we need to also see and understand there's somebody else who's troubled at this time. Jesus himself is troubled. In John chapter 13 and verse 21, the Bible tells us when Jesus said these things, he was troubled in spirit and he testified and said, most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. This word troubled here is an interesting one in the language. Go back to John chapter 11. And in John chapter 11, and I think it's about verse 23, Jesus is, no, verse 33, excuse me, when Jesus is meeting with Martha and then Mary in the house, and you know they're weeping because Lazarus has died, and they're all uh, coming to Jesus with the same words, Lord, if you'd only been here, then Lazarus wouldn't have died. We wouldn't be sorrowing and we wouldn't be experiencing these things. And the Bible says here, then, therefore, John eleven thirty three, 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And this word is a groaning, a deep moving of our spirit that is inside us. And brethren, when the Bible says Jesus was troubled, he was troubled to this extent here in John 13. Wouldn't you be troubled if a person closest to you for all those years is now going to betray you and hand you over to your enemies? Wouldn't you be troubled when you know that you're going to go back to the Father, but it's through the suffering of the cross and the burial in the tomb? It is a wonderful thing for me in one aspect to think of this context of trouble here. Apostles were troubled. Jesus himself was troubled. And brethren, if you and I find ourselves troubled from a time to time and occasionally, we're in good company, aren't we? And so this is the context in which cheerful words are needed, comforting words, words of assurance. And this is the context that we see here. There is the experience of trouble. And Jesus told his disciples, this is the way things were going to be. Brethren, we understand in this world about trouble, don't we? All we have to say is 2020. <laughs> but in reality, maybe our normalcy and our luxuries and our comforts and our other things have maybe obscured to us that in this world, we're always going to have trouble. That's the nature of the world. And whether we face economic trouble today or political trouble or the social unrest or other kind of things, it's been that way if you live long enough, you can look back and see how it's been. I was talking with my dad at one time and uh, he said, 1968 was the most troubled year I ever saw <laughs> till 2020. <laughs> All right, But you see, if you live long enough, you're going to see those kind of things repeat. And brethren, that's the way of the world. But be of good cheer, Jesus says, I've overcome the world. Well, let's notice some words of comfort in a very troubling time. These are, the, again, the words Jesus said. These words I have spoken. What words, Jesus? The words from chapter 13 all the way through chapter 17. Here's the words of comfort. Here's the words of good cheer. First of all, comfort is provided in this section of teaching by the promise of the comforter. All right? Through over uh, a section of uh, scriptures from John chapter 14, John chapter 15, and John chapter 16, Jesus is telling his disciples about the comforter. He tells them in John chapter 14 and verse 15, uh, 16, excuse me, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth. And again, here is a great word to study in the original language. 
The word in Greek is parakletos. It's a hard word to translate in just one English word. It's used in a lot of different ways. Here throughout the section, some of your Bibles, if they are consistent, they call this the comforter. Or here in the New King James, it's, uh, and it's pretty, pretty consistent. It's always the helper. All right? That's what the parakletos does. That's what a paraclete does. It gives help. It gives aid. It gives comfort. The para, to call alongside. The kletos, to call a helper to be with you. All right? And these disciples were going to need helpers. Jesus said to them in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. When a rabbi died and he had a school of disciples who followed him, if that rabbi died and passed away, his disciples were then used in the terminology of the time. They were called orphans. And it's the same in the ancient Greek world. Uh, in ancient Athens, when Socrates was forced to drink the hemlock because he was accused of perverting the youth of Athens, his disciples after his death were called orphans. Now Jesus is looking at the 12 and he says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send the helper to you. And so this helper is promised in verse 26 of John 14. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring a remembrance, uh, remembrance of me uh, and what I said to you. In chapter 15, uh, Jesus tells them uh, again uh, about the comforter in verse 26, uh, verse 26. But when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from me, he will testify of me. And then, of course, in John chapter 16 and verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And then verse 13, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you the, the things to come. The promise of the comforter here is uh, an important promise so that the disciples would not be left as orphans. And brethren, again, we need to understand here, this is some very specific language directed toward the apostles. We are not to take these words out of context and say, the Holy Spirit's going to guide me into all truth. The Holy Spirit has already done that. And we have his word here. This is what this lectureship is about all this week, the God-breathed word. And so here is the comforter giving words of comfort to God's people in every age. Because as we read the words that the helper gave and the reminding of the teaching that Jesus had, you and I can be of good cheer because of the work of the comforter. We also see and understand that it is in this idea of uh, uh, Jesus' continued intercession that uh, also comfort comes to the disciples. Do you know Jesus is also called the comforter? 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, My little children, these things I write to you that you sin not, and if any, any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Now, that's the same word, paraclete, parakletos, but it's now talking about Jesus' work. He's our advocate. He's our man in heaven. And of course, the Hebrew writer will mention this uh, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, beginning with verse 14. Seeing then that we have our, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but in all points was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find, um, obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He ever lives to make intercession for us, Hebrews 7, 25. And brethren, what a great thing to know that Jesus, though he departed from his disciples, he sent the comforter, the Holy Spirit, yet even then he is interceding for his saints. Brethren, He's our man in heaven. Isn't it great to have somebody who can intercede for you who knows what's going on in your life? 
knows what you've been through. When Jesus walked through this world and he's hungry and he's thirsty, when he suffers rejection from family and friends, when he's finally taken and crucified and going through all that physical pain there, he's our man in heaven because he knows what we, you and I go through. And so we have comfort in Jesus' continued inter, intercession. And the intercession here that the Hebrew writer spoke of, where he says we can come boldly through the throne, to the throne of grace, tells us about another comforting aspect that is found in these pages here in John chapter 13 through John chapter 17. And it is in the form of intercessory prayer that Jesus makes for you and me. You know, he's our man in heaven interceding. He ever lives to make intercession for the saints. Well, what kind of intercession is that like? Well, take a look at John 17 and you'll find what his intercession is like for us. First of all, in John 17, verses 1 through 5, Jesus is talking about a petition for himself. The hour has come. Father, glorify your Son, so that the Son may also glorify you. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. In these, the first section of the prayer, Jesus prays for himself. Brethren, it's not wrong to pray for ourselves sometimes. Now, it's wrong if that's all we can do. <laughs> but even the Savior needed God's help. And so he pleaded for that. He needed God's help because he would be abandoned and left and the disciples would be scattered like sheep. And he needed God's help because he would face that cross all alone. And he needed God's help for all the suffering he was going to go through. And so he's asking that God would glorify him. But you know how God glorified Jesus? By his suffering first for you and me. In the second part of this prayer in John chapter 17 in verses 6 through 19, Jesus is praying for the apostles. This immediate group is going to be left behind. And Jesus is praying for them. And he says that uh, I'm not praying that they would be taken out of the world. You know, when we face trouble and we go through a lot of different difficult times, when our first reaction is, I got to get away from this. Let me get to the mountaintop. Let me get to the seaside. Let me be out of this overwhelming bit of trouble. Jesus says that's not our option or choice, is it? Jesus instead says, uh, I do not pray that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. Jesus is praying for the protection of the apostles and that they would fulfill his message. But you know, the most comforting words that I find in this prayer are found in verses 20 and 21. And here Jesus is praying for the people who would believe through the testimony of the apostles. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Brethren, can you see this? The night in which Jesus will be betrayed, the night in which Jesus are, is sharing these words, in the shadow of the cross, Jesus was thinking about you and me. For those who will believe through their word. How have you come to know Jesus? He talked to you last night? Come and tell you what to do to be saved? How do we know about Jesus? Jesus. The only way we know about Jesus is through what those apostles left with their testimony. And when they preached that originally, it was a preaching that would cause faith and belief. And when these words were preserved for us by the Holy Spirit in our New Testament, they are so that you and I can believe. And we have come to faith in Jesus because they gave that testimony. But notice with me as well in verse 21, Jesus wants us who are left here that he was thinking about and praying for. Jesus said that they all may be one 
as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus wants you and I to be united, doesn't he? He wants us to be united because he's the Savior who died for each and every one of us. Black, white, red, yellow, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, digger of ditches, or man who sends a rocket into space. Jesus wants us all to be one. And so here's an intercessory prayer that gives great comfort to me when I look at it and read it. But Jesus also spoke in these words here, words of comfort that told about peace. In John chapter 14 and verse 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And of course, in John 16, 33, these things that I've spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. What is the peace that Jesus is describing here? Most of us define peace as absence of conflict, don't we? That's when a peaceful, tranquil, there's nothing bothering me today. You know, I can sit back and nobody's going to interrupt. And there's not going to be a call from Brian say, Bruce, will you preach tomorrow? Because our speaker's backed out. <laughs> Talk about your interruptions. Thank you, Brian. But brethren, what's peace that Jesus is talking about here? It's peace in the midst of the world's convulsions and the world's trials and the world's pushing back on us. And Jesus said, you can still have peace. We can have peace because we know that Jesus has made peace for us with our Father. How does sinful man approach a holy God? Vince spoke in his lesson of Psalm 119 about the salvation that the psalmist was longing for and looking for, and he had it as far as he could have it in the Old Testament, but he still needed the peace of the Lamb that came and was slain for you and me. And brethren, when that peace is made with God and sinful man, then we can also have peace with one another. The world has all kind of things that seeks to divide us, doesn't it? But God wants us to have peace. And that peace is found in these words of Jesus Christ. And so there is a peace imparted. Jesus will also talk about a joy that is imparted. And we don't have a lot of time to get into it. But in John chapter 16 and verses 22 through 22, Jesus talks about the sorrow that comes upon a woman when she's in labor. But that sorrow is then transformed, isn't it? I see several mothers out here. And I can't imagine what mother goes through to bring this child into the world and the pain that it brings. But Jesus says that pain is momentary. And then when that child is there and everything's well and mother and baby are fine, all that pain's been forgotten. The disciples were going to go through pain, real pain, yes. And brethren, we go through real pain here, yes. But it's temporary. And God wants us to know it's going to be over. And we need to see so that our joy can be full as Jesus spoke with us. And that your heart may rejoice and your joy no one will take away from you. Well, these are a lot of comforting words, aren't they? Real quickly... Let me share with you as well that there are also challenging words in this context from John chapter 13 through 17. Jesus was leaving this world, but his mission was going to continue, wasn't it? It wasn't going to end with his return to heaven. It was going to continue in the work of the apostles and again, there are several things directed in these chapters that are specifically aimed for the apostles. And we need to be very careful that we don't claim what is, uh, was intended for them as something for us. But brethren, they're still here in these uh, words of the mission of Christ. Things that apply to every Christian, not just the twelve. 
and we need to see this as well. Real quickly, and I'll, I'll pass through this in a, in a way that's fast. There are challenging words to every servant, every child of God to be a servant of God, right? What happens there in John chapter 13? Where Jesus is knowing he's going back to the Father and knowing that the Father had given him everything and that he, was, he had come from God and he was going back from God. Jesus rises up from the supper and he takes a towel and he laid aside his garment and girds himself and he pours water into a basin. He begins to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. The challenge to be a servant is for every single child of God. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The Bible says that Jesus, in the context there in Mark chapter 10, when he spoke those words, was when uh, Peter, or, or James and John, Lord, let us sit at your right hand and at your left hand. Everything will be great. And Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Father's going to give it to whom he's appointed. But he wants all of them to know that you need to be about serving and not about being lords. Man, in this world's got all the lords we need, doesn't it? A bunch of them are sitting in Congress. We've had one sitting in the presidency. A bunch of others are sitting in the Senate Hall. And they all act like lords and kings. They've forgotten their servants for us. But you know, Washington will never get it, and it's not going to come from the top down. It's going to be from the bottom up as you and I will learn to be servants. And we're still learning that lesson. Disciples took a long time to learn that lesson, didn't they? Here's Jesus the night before he's to be betrayed and all these other kind of things and he's got one last sermon to preach to his guys. What's he preaching? Be a servant. And he's not doing it with words. He's doing it with actions as he's washing feet. The job for the lowest servant in the household because when you recline at a meal and you are having somebody else's feet in your face as you're eating... You need some clean feet, don't you? And brethren, none of those disciples said, that's my job, I'll do it. In fact, there were probably a whole lot of folks that said, you know, I'm one of these guys, that's for somebody else. And how many times do we come to the work of the church and see the tough, nitty-gritty, dirty jobs that need to get done in the church that's not my contract. It's not for me. Brandon, there's a challenge to be a servant. There's a challenge to learn to love like Jesus. Jesus said in this same chapter, John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this will all men know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Love and commandment doesn't seem to go well in our world. How can you command love? You know, I fall into love, and I think I have these emotions that are all about love, and how can you command love? Oh, you can command love. Jesus does it on this occasion. Because you see, it's not about whether somebody has earned my affections and not about how somebody has treated me, but it's about doing the will of Jesus, fulfilling his mission. And so we learn to love. And Jesus says, as we do this, this is our badge of discipleship. I've got on a badge here today. School of Preaching has given it to us, instructors and board members. They want us to wear these. But brethren, where's a badge for telling us that we're belonging to Jesus? You got one? I didn't get one. You got a little card in your wallet that says belonging to Christ? I can print one up. We can distribute them all out and it'd be great, wouldn't it? 
We don't have a uniform. We don't have a badge. We don't have a card. All we have is love. And that's how we can show that we belong to Jesus. Everyone needs to love like Christ. We need to have faith. Jesus said here in John chapter 14 and verse 1, you believe in God, believe also in me. And brethren, it is faith. Very, very simple thing in one say to say it. Whole nother thing to actually believe it. I believe, I believe, I believe. Okay. Reminds me of what uh, the tightrope walker Blondine said when he was crossing Niagara Falls. He's getting ready to go across. And he looked at the crowd who was watching him and he said, How many of you believe that I can walk across this tightrope across the Niagara Falls? And there was a kind of a loud mouth guy in there and he said, I believe, I believe. And Blondine says, Come up here. Let me carry you on my back while I do it. <laughs> Brethren, Everybody says they believe in Jesus. But brethren, have we put our faith and trust in him? Have we committed ourselves to him? Are we convinced of this and convicted of Jesus? The Lord wants us to believe. We also need to understand that we, when we believe, we give voice to what we believe in the prayers that we ask. There's several times here in these passages that Jesus tells the disciples, and again, we do not need to overreach on this, but Jesus tells, uh, if you ask anything in my name, John 14, 13, I will do, that I will do, and the Father may be glorified in the Son. Uh, John 15 and verse 7, uh, Jesus said, uh, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, and you ask for what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Uh, John 16 and verse 23, uh, Jesus again says here, In that day you ask me nothing, and most assuredly I say to you, Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. And again, some of this is... Uh, language for the apostles and for what they were going to face and what they were going to over, undergo. But brethren, we need to pray in faith, don't we? Trusting that if you have the faith even as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be removed, and it would. And I'm not telling us to pray for the miraculous and other kind of things, but brethren, we need to pray with some deeper prayers. And know that as we're praying, it's not about whether I had enough faith that this was fulfilled, but it's because I've got my faith in the object, God, the one who answers prayer. And over and over again, Jesus here is challenging his disciples, his disciples to have faith. And he's challenging you and I to have faith as we would lift up our voices in prayer. Confess your faults one to another. And pray for one another that you might be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And brethren, the last uh, thing that I want to mention in this challenging word is that Jesus challenges us to abide in him. Very famous passage of the, the vine and the branches. John chapter 15, verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. And as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Brethren, the challenge for you and I who have made our initiation in Christ is to continue in him, to abide in him, to remain in him. And it's a mutual indwelling. We in Christ and Christ in us. And as Christ is in us, brethren, then there's fruit, isn't there? Much fruit. I like that word in the original language. It's polycarp. And if you know church history, there's a famous guy by the name of polycarp who in his martyrdom for Jesus was bearing much fruit. Challenging words, comforting words, 
But sometimes I look at these things and I wonder, how can I do all these things? How can I give good cheer in the midst of trouble? And how can I fulfill the mission of Jesus when it's so challenging? And brethren, again, it comes through this understanding. It's Jesus in us who gives us this competency. Without me, you can do nothing. Apostle Paul stated it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. He said, and who is sufficient for these things? Brian, don't you and I feel that way so many times? Who's sufficient for it? The sufficiency doesn't come from ourselves. The sufficiency comes from he who stood in the shadow of the cross, spoke these things, and then went to the cross and overcame and rose triumphantly on the third day. And it is Jesus, the overcomer. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. I haven't removed the world and any problems and obstacles, but I have overcome it. And brethren, you and I can be overcomers as well. In 1 John chapter 5 and beginning with verse 4, Jesus, uh, John wrote and he says, Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And then in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, the Bible tells us about the dragon, that great dragon that was so powerful, he pulled down a third of the stars from heaven and he made war with the woman and her child and with the saints. And the Bible says this in Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto death. How can I do it? How can we do it? How can we complete the mission of Christ? How can we give cheerful, comforting words of peace and joy? Not from ourselves, but through Jesus, the overcomer. Do you desire to overcome sin tonight? You can do it in Jesus. Do you need a way to overcome death tonight? We can do it in Jesus because he defeated sin at the cross and he defeated the grave when he rose on the third day. And brethren, when maybe sometimes we're tempted to say, oh yeah, that sounds like a good thing. I'd like to buy into Christianity, but I just don't know if I can do it. Again, apart from me, you can do nothing. But in Jesus, we can overcome Jesus takes care of my sin problem. Jesus takes care of my death problem. Jesus takes care of my living for him and the problems that sometimes surface there. How about you? Will you let Jesus take care of these problems for you? We're going to sing the invitation song tonight. If you believe and trust in the Savior who died for you, will you repent of your sins? Will you confess him before men and be buried with him to rise to walk in newness of life? Won't you come as we stand and sing?
Just a moment, Tim's going to lead us in a closing song, and what song would that be, Brother Tim? 500, so turn your songbooks to number 500. We appreciate your being with us tonight. Had a great two lessons uh, to go along with the rest of them during this day. Uh, really enriching uh, feast we've had on God's Word. We want to invite you back tomorrow, uh, tomorrow at 9 a.m. Yeah, there's a couple chapters in here. Uh, David Steersman's chapter in the book is, is tremendous, and it's a topic that a lot of brethren are not well informed on, and so great lesson tomorrow on canonicity, which books belong, or which books belong, yeah, well, I guess in the Bible supposed to be there, but which books belong, and then George Beals, and this was the one he was assigned for the lectureship he spoke today to fill in for Jody Apple, but uh, tomorrow morning, Scripture and 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and then as we mentioned earlier today, Jeff Jenkins will not be here. And so I will take his lesson on the Word of God under fire, and that's about Jeremiah 36, where Jehoiakim tried to cut out some part, or try to cut up God's Word, uh, but we'll see how that turned out tomorrow. And then the afternoon sessions tomorrow, another chapter in the book that's one that I've never seen written anywhere, and that is Bias and Bible Interpretation. Brother Chad Tagto is scheduled to be there. And then uh, Sound versus Unsound Hermeneutics, Brother Terrence Brown Lodendi, he'll deliver a message on that. In fact, he's teaching hermeneutics even this semester, a night class at Eagle Lake Church of Christ. And it's not too late to sign up for that if you'd like. Uh, just see us about that. And then um, finally, Steve Atnip at the end, the last lesson, the forum. And uh, he is filling in for Jody Apple on that one, but Jesus' application of hermeneutics. And that whole forum topic has to do with interpreting the Bible and some of the challenges we come across with that. And then our afternoon session or our evening sessions, Larry Williams, Psalm 19, Wisdom for Life's Direction. And then Jimmy Clark, uh, cl uh, Calming Words from Philippians chapter 4, 6 through 8. And it's good to see he made it in tonight, and so we're thankful for that. But if you can join us tomorrow, we'd love to have you uh, on person especially, but also online. However you can participate in our lectureship, we would love to have you with us uh, tomorrow. And so keep us in mind as we continue through. We appreciate the prayers of brethren. Uh, we are having the lectureship. We don't want to flaunt it. We're just going about our business, uh, studying God's Word. Great topic, great lesson so far, and we expect the same tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday. And we'd invite you to join us if you can. Uh, and also, we... we you know, beg you to help us out uh, with the cost, and uh, we've always come through in the past, and so we expect no different than during this lectureship, but if you can help us out, we'd much appreciate it. All right, and so as we mentioned, Brother Tim's going to lead us in that song, after which Brother Emmanuel Daugherty is going to lead us in a closing prayer, and it's good to have them with, with us from Daytona Beach, and we appreciate all their support that they give us throughout the years and their contribution in enlightening, shedding light on God's Word as we saw tonight. And so, Brother Tim, Brother Manuel, and then you will be dismissed. The song again is 500, 500. Zero, zero.
Our holy God in heaven, we are thankful for this time to be gathered together. We have had a great day of fellowship and rejoicing, praising thy name and hearing from thy word. We pray, Father, that we have listened well, that we have learned some things today that will draw us closer and closer to thee and to thy Son. Our Father, help us to live in such a way that heaven will be our home in the after while. We're thankful for the good men who have presented lessons today for those who are yet to come. We pray for uh, our safe travel as we go back and forth during this week that all will be well with us. Our Father, bless this congregation for their oversight of this, uh, this school of preaching and for the faculty and the director and all who are, uh, are participating and having a part in this great work. We pray for schools of preaching and others that are faithful to thee as uh, they are training men to take the place of those of us who will soon leave this earth. Father, help us always to be faithful to the end. This is our prayer in Jesus' name.